right, welcome to Soil and Water Science Day. Uh, we're broadcasting live from Fort White Alive in Winnipeg, Manitoba. We are on Treaty 1 territory, homeland of the Anishinaabe, Cree and Dakota people and the birthplace and the homeland of the Métis Nation. I'd like to welcome you all here from all across Manitoba. Uh, my name is Katrina uh, and this is Fort White Alive behind me. Um, we have people tuning in from uh, Barron's River, Gillum, Leaf Rapids, Snow Lake, Black River, Waterhen, Wanapagao, Moose Lake, um, and welcome to Balder School in rural Manitoba and Winnipeg students from Seven Oaks Met School, Fort Richmond Collegiate, Westwood Collegiate, Murdoch McKay, Garden City Collegiate, and some students uh, watching from home as well. Um, Fort White is committed to teaching humans about nature through environmental education. So we often welcome groups of students here and we go out onto the landscape and we learn about uh, science outside. Um, sustainability is really important to Fort White as well. And our theme today of soil and water is really connected to sustainability because having safe and abundant food and fresh water on our planet is really important for us today, but it's also important for the future. Today is our first virtual experience of a specialty science day here at Fort White, but we've held many experiences here in the past, such as our Arctic Science Day, Freshwater Ecology Day, and Soil Science Day as well. We work with expert partners who you will meet very soon, um, who can share uh, their knowledge about working in environmental research or uh, about the way that things work in agriculture. Uh, and that's part of what you'll be learning about today. We have partners from Manitoba Ag Agriculture, from Nutrients for Life, which is an organization that teaches about nutrients and how they produce food. And we also have a water educator coming from uh, Experimental Lakes Area, which is an organization that studies lake ecosystems. So lots to learn about here today. Um, so learn about questions like, what are the connections between soil and water? Uh, how does soil form over time? How uh, does agriculture relate to the health of aquatic ecosystems? What needs to be in the soil in order for food crops to be able to grow properly? What are the characteristics of healthy lakes? And how can the lake be affected when something happens on the land that gets into the lake? So you've come to the right place to find the answers to all these questions. Right beside me here is Jacqueline. I'm going to pass her over the mic and she's just going to let you know a little of information about how to tune it, how to use the YouTube channel. Just a second here. Thank you. Hi folks, I'm Jacqueline Monteith, science instructional coach with Frontier School Division. A huge hello to all of our groups across the province. It's fantastic to have you out. Uh, sorry for the bit of a delay earlier. We are figuring this out on our end as we go as well. Um, a couple notes for today, if you would like to participate in the chat feature on the YouTube channel, please make sure you sign in. That way you will be able to access the chat feature, ask questions in real time. I'll be um, moderating for today and I'll be asking questions on your behalf. When you do ask a question, please be sure to state who the question is from, your name, what grade you're in, and what school or community you're from. And that way uh, we'll give you that shout out as we go through the questions today. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything else we're missing. Oh, um, again, our internet out here is a, a little bit off and on today. So if things do cut out, rest assured, we'll be right back on. And if needed, you can always access the recordings, which should be up in the next day or two on our Frontier School Division website. So feel free to access those recordings um, at any time after they're posted. All right, a big thank you to Jacqueline Monteith and the Frontier crew for making this possible for us here at Fort White today. We're gonna to transition indoors to Mr. Ray Cochran from Nutrients for Life, who's gonna teach you about soil types, soil formation, uh, and you'll get a bit of a, the basics about what is soil. So we'll see you inside. Morning. I'm Ray Cochran. I'm from Nutrients for Life. Uh, I'm part of the presentation that's going to be on the Soils and Water Day here at Fort White Nature Center. I have a couple of troublemakers, cohorts here, that will be assisting in the presentation. They'll each have their own presentation as well. This is Mr. Kent LaWarren. He's also from Nutrients for Life. He's from Pilot Mound, Manitoba. And this is Mr. Mitchell Timmerman. And he's with Manitoba Agriculture. 
and he lives in uh, Winnipeg, but hails from Treehern. Tree yes, so, Tree and I'm personally from Verdon, Manitoba. So we have a wide range of uh, spectrum where we live in Manitoba here. So today I'm going to be talking about soil formation and properties. And basically, I just wanted to make sure you distinguish between soil and dirt. Dirt is something you find underneath your fingernails and it is basically a non-living entity. It's dead, I refer to it as. Soil in turn is a living entity containing life, such as microorganisms, etc., which we'll get into in a bit. So now, how does, what is soil like? How is it formed? So basically, there are different ways it is formed. And these are the factors. And we have climate here. Now, climate will be such things as rain, temperature, wind, etc. That will cause weathering of the rock and it will slowly start to break down. If we look at the globe that Mitchell has here and we compare, say, Manitoba to, oh, let's go to India, where India is over here, we should realize that obviously the climate is going to be different. So we're going to have different types of soil worldwide and also Canada-wide and right within Manitoba itself. So we have a Yes, and uh, are you a Game of Thrones fan? No, I'm right? not, sorry. Oh, well, there's, uh, maybe Kent knows it, uh, the, the operative phrase from Game of Thrones, what season is coming when the snow falls and the mercury drops? Winter is coming, and that's a key <laughs> difference. Here, not to sound too ominous, Kent, and, and spook you uh, early on in the day, but winter is coming, and that's a key difference here versus, as you suggested, Such Ray. India. Yes. Yeah, Canada has a six-month pause, roughly speaking, known as winter, during which soil-forming factors uh, do not operate. Mm, and I guess we look at India with the monsoon rains, etc. Yes, exactly. Different parts of the world. Uh, and here's the other main. Piece this that we here is basically Lake Agassiz, which basically is the glacier. And as the glacier receded, it basically wore away uh, through grinding actions, etc. <coughs> wore away the bedrock and also deposited different types of minerals, etc., etc. This was about oh, 12,000 years ago as this slowly receded. So that would be climate. Organisms, biological organisms. Now, as I'd said, I consider soil to be a living entity because it has a massive number of microorganisms. We have fungi, bacteria, etc., etc. So what happens is that they start to break material down. And for instance, we have this plant here, plant material, and then with winter coming along, this is gonna die obviously, and it will slowly be broken down and performing <coughs> into a humus eventually. So that is what is going to form into some of the soil, just the breaking down of plant material. And that's one example of an organism. There are other kinds of creepy crawlies in the soil, yeah, worms, earthworms. Uh, nem nematodes or tiny worms, insects. Uh, yeah, all kinds of creatures, right. including microorganisms that we can't see without, right. a, yeah. without a microscope. They claim that if you take one tablespoon of soil, you can contain up to one billion microorganisms. So you can see a tremendous uh, importance there. And then, of course, big critters that farmers tend to have a problem with. Uh, mascot of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Kent, you're wearing green today. You're cheering for the wrong team. Uh, <laughs> I think, it, is it Gary the Gopher? Anyway, the mascot, right? Farmers, uh, definitely unbest friend. Gophers being an example of a large creature that uh, can move around a lot of soil beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. R is basic relief or topography. And basically, Topography, we think of whether it's flat land or whether it's rolling land, etc., etc. What we have here is an example of a rolling landscape and with rainfall occurring. Now, as rain occurs with this knoll, you'll see that there is a lateral downward movement of water. There's also some rainfall that permeates or gets into the soil, but dependent upon the amount of elevation will relate to the amount of rainfall. Now, what happens is that 
if this is fairly steep and this accumulates, if we have a high water table or if it leads to a high water table, you can actually find accumulation of water into the, in the low depressions. This in turn can lead to some issues with the soil underneath. And one of the issues is that generally what happens when it's flowing downwards, it washes calcium carbonate down, a mineral downwards. But if you have a high water table and a tremendous amount, it doesn't wash down and it starts to accumulate up near the surface. So in reality, people will go out, the agronomists, soil people with uh, agriculture people, if they go out and do a quick test with hydrochloric acid, they can determine if the soil is well drained or not. And the test they use mm -hmm. is nothing the worse. Test. Yeah, well, this is hydrochloric this. acid. And Mitchell's going to hold up basically some soil here. And we're going to, are you able to zoom in with this? Okay. Now I'm going to apply some hydrochloric acid. And I'm hoping you are able to see it fizz. Kent, do you, uh, do you enjoy you? I'll the occasional 7-Up? The occasional Or Pepsi? Up. Yes? All right. Do you know what the gas is that's emanating from the bottle when the lid is cracked and, oh, I hear a, a hiss? I do. Or a fizz? Yes. And it is? CO2, and that's exactly what's happening here. So hydrochloric acid is reacting with the carbonate and is releasing CO2. And that's, henceforth, the fizz. So basically, an agronomist can go out in the field and do that simple little test and determine if that soil is well-drained or not. If it is very well-drained, there would be no fizzing. Yeah, and from a soil formation standpoint, the depth at which the carbonates are found, as Ray is describing, indicates how well-developed how grown up the soil can be. If there is sufficient downward movement that the carbonates are found deep in the soil, it tells us more about uh, how fully developed the soil is, what type it is, and uh, what, its, uh, what its identity is, compared to, as Ray was describing, in lower positions in the landscape where downward movement can be impeded, or at the knoll where there's not much opportunity up at the top of the hill for the water to soak in, instead it runs off, the carbonates are more likely to be found closer to the surface, and that means we may find a less developed soil and of a very different type of soil compared at the, the mid-slope position with both mm -hmm. implications for what we call the dirt, what type it is, using dirt, of course, as a, as a, a term of perfection <laughs> and endearment, Ray, not disrespect. Uh, uh, and so from a soil survey, soil classification standpoint, the fizz test is useful. And then as you were describing, from a practical standpoint for modern day farming, the depth of the fizz tells right. a farmer and agronomist whether or not drainage could be a problem and a crop may suffer from excess moisture, may drown out. Right, mm -hmm. good. Then the P here refers to parent material. All right, now parent material can be either granite, which we have over here. This is an example of granite. And then we have shale. This is an example of shale. And we have oh, limestone. Oh, sorry. Okay. So there's granite. Okay. Over there. Shield country. Yeah. And basic granite will break down into forming sand particles, which we'll get into in a minute. This is limestone. Very prevalent in the interlake mm -hmm. of Manitoba. And limestone will break down eventually to form clay particles. And it's from the limestone that the carbonates have been distributed right. uh, that we we're detecting using the fizz test. Right. Uh, yes. Uh, the glaciers distributed even tiny amounts of limestone throughout much of Manitoba, which is then uh, what, what enables us to do the fizz test and find. Yeah. The and then this is shale. Now shale, when it breaks down, can actually form either sand, silt, or clay. So that basically is the parent material. So all of these are soil forming factors. However, this doesn't occur just overnight. This actually occurs 
over time. And time can be thousands of years. For instance, the glacier receding was about 12,000 years ago. So it takes a very, very long time to form soil. So that's why basically in agriculture, it is very important to take care of your soil because we don't want to lose soil through uh, erosion, etc. because we, it's a non-renewable resource, basically, mm -hmm. except maybe over uh, 12,000 years. Or choosing carefully where to grow houses right. instead yes. of crops yes. to, to feed people and livestock. Yes. So, uh, the cities are growing at an alarming rate, obviously, and they're overtaken in some parts of the world tremendously good, rich, fertile farmland. Yes, which makes sense because the community was originally dis established this for and, agriculture and good soil society. to then uh, right. support the local, yeah. uh, the local community, right? And then yeah. with expansion, that's uh -huh. a, a loss of the uh, soil resource. Now, I'd mentioned the parent material and what it breaks down into. We have basically the three major types. They are sand here. Okay, we also then have silt. Now sand, you know where you can find that. You can find it on your beaches, etc., etc. Silt actually is found on, in rivers where they basically, you can think of it as they meander around and there's a bend. It'll wash this silt out. And silt is in between sand and the third component, which is clay. These are the three major size yes. fractions. Now, so, yes. I like to say, okay, when we compare those three in size dimensions, I like to kind of play a little visualization game. You could think of one particle of sand as the size of a football stadium. So if you could just visualize that, then we're going to take one particle of silt and we're going to say it is the size of a half-ton truck sitting inside the football stadium. In turn, clay is the size of a postage stamp inside the half-ton truck that is then inside the football stadium. So you can see just by the size, dimensions of these uh, soil types that they're going to have different uh, structures, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and uh, the ability to tra uh, transport water, hold plants upright, etc. So now, uh, uh, logically, then, Ray, from soil formation to the different properties. That yes, we can do that. One soil from another. Now, soils have many different properties. One of them is texture. Another is structure, and we're going to look at color. And we'll, if we have time, we'll look at the calcium carbonate again, briefly right here, which we've already done. Now, texture is basically determined by two different ways. This is a little experiment. Now, I lost, I don't know where I put it. I had a jar, and what you could do this little experiment at home. It's pretty straightforward. All you do is you take a, a jar, you put some soil so it's about two-thirds full, fill it up with water, Put the lid on nice and tight and shake the heck out of it and make sure the water is, the, all the soil is wet, okay? Really shake it well. Then you can put it down and let it sit for about one minute. And basically, the, you should see some separation. Ideally, after one minute, you should see a layer of sand at the bottom. It is important at that point in time to quickly take a marking pen and make that mark where that sand is. All right, then you can lay it down, sit it down and leave it for 24 hours because at that point in time, it'll take that long for them to silt the settle out and you'll form a layer of clay. So then you should be able to measure out where the silt and the clay particles are. Then what you can do is quickly measure, quickly measure the height of each layer. Okay, so that then will give you an idea, okay, where, how much material is in that sample. Now, I think you people already have 
this here, this triangle like this. Oh, and I have a large scale soil dish. channel. Do you? Okay. Yeah, oh, there. Well. Okay. Yeah. If you have that soil triangle, I'll show you what I did. Okay, yep. So this is a little exercise that's very simple to do. And all I did was randomly choose some numbers here for you. I hope you can see this. And what I measured out, I sand, I put it at 30 millimeters, silt was 22 millimeters, clay at 25 millimeters. Added them all up. Added them all up. And the total was 77 millimeters. Then I calculated the percentage for each one. Okay? Can you see this okay? Oh. Sorry, we're just hanging on. We're trying to get things a little bit better here for you. Hang tough. We'll get there. <laughs> There. How's that? Yep. Perfect? All right, good. Okay, so all I did, I measured them out. Sand was 30 millimeters, silt was 22, clay was 25. The total was 77. Then I quickly calculated the percentage for each one of those. And uh, 30 over 77 times 100, etc. So I ended up with 39, 29, 32, and I come to 100%. So now you can use these numbers here, the percentiles, and use the triangle. So you may see sand here. I put a little asterisk there. The sand is at 39%, so I put a little asterisk there. And then I drew a straight line up to where it intersected with the clay. Then I did the same thing with silt. It was at about 29%, and I drew it straight down towards the sand. And then with the clay, I went straight across to the silt. But the most important part is that where they intersect, right there, you'll find that this one actually intersected in the clay loam. So this specific example, I could say that that sample I, I got with my jar was a clay loam soil. If in turn they all intersected down here, it's a sandy loam, all right? So though it's a simple little exercise, you can find the actual technique how to do this right on, uh, if you Google it, YouTube it, they'll show it you step by step, it's pretty easy to do, and it's kind of a fun thing if you happen to have a garden and you want to basically determine what kind of soil type do I actually have. Now, I'm gonna put these two gentlemen to work because I think you people also have this chart. Oh uh, yes, the flow diagram for the hand flow texturing. diagram for hand texturing. Mm -hmm. So Kent and Mitchell are going to proceed with this, and as they are doing it, they will determine what kind of soil they're actually playing with and the reason why they feel that this is what it is, all right? Now this is um, not an easy exercise and it takes some skill, so don't panic if you kind of don't get it right. Don't worry about it. Just try the technique and we'll go from there. Okay. Where do I start on the chart, right? You go for it, right at the start. Where it says start. Start, come on, man. Okay, there they are. They're putting a little bit of soil in each of the palms. So I started with about a tablespoon, and I'm just going to get it wet. And I'm trying to see if I can make it kind of like Play-Doh. Yeah. Will it form a ball? Will it hold together? And I can already tell, Kent, that mine is fragile. And it's, I it's... can tell mine is awesome. <laughs> It's going to form a great ball. This is what I usually do. I subject it to a little bit of stress. And I, I can, I'm not sure if the camera will be able to pick that up, but the ball that I formed originally is already starting to fragment. Oh, I can come closer. Sure thing. 
And based on how it felt when it hit my hand, I already had a pretty good inkling as to whether I was touching a, a sand silt or a clay kent. And uh, as the camera should be able to show, uh, the ball that I originally formed is starting to break apart. And then subsequent to that, as the flow diagram indicates, I am to try to form oh, a ribbon. <laughs> That's a ribbon. Either a ribbon or a spindle. Hmm. And of course, as uh, we uh, like to um, maintain in the uh, Department of Agriculture and Resource Development, Kent, it's not that a soil is good or bad. It's that a soil is suited for one purpose better than another. And as you may guess, the soil sample that I'm holding is uh, probably better suited for sand castling uh, than, for instance, uh, clay pottery. And this one would make awesome pottery. Yes, yes. This is an awesome ball. It holds its structure very nicely. Yes. And you can form a spindle or a ribbon and that I, I can't can do. a great ribbon with this one. So I'm just squeezing it between my thumb and my forefinger. Mm -hmm. and trying to make a ribbon that's going straight up. And I can make a nice, wow. tall, long, strong ribbon. Defying gravity. Yes, Impressive. defying gravity. Whereas in the case of my sample, I can't form a ribbon at all. I can also hear oh, can the grittiness. Hear the grittiness. <laughs> yeah, so we, we're presenting uh, two extremes in this first scenario uh, from different ends of the textural spectrum from the very coarse, or sand, the largest soil particles, as Ray was explaining earlier, to the smallest size fraction at the clay end of the spectrum. And this is pretty much 100% clay. This is, this is a sample from near Morris, and it's actually called Red River Clay. Yes, that's huh. yeah, the name of Good. the soil. And so to uh, follow the procedure from the top of the page down, roughly speaking, first it's try to form a ball. If it doesn't, then it's just a sand. If it forms a ball, then uh, presumably it's, a, it's at least a loamy yep. sand. And then we proceed down the page, down the flow diagram, to then, as Kent has illustrated, form a ribbon, the length of which determines whether or not I follow track one, two, or three to determine that it's either a loam, a clay loam, or a clay. And then to further modify the answer, as I mentioned earlier, there is the feel and the here test. In my case, this is an obvious example of a very coarse sand. I can both feel and hear the grittiness, and thus I'm not expecting to go far down the page at all. By contrast, Kent, you would expect to reach the bottom of the page, Absolutely. and the far right I'm kind is of likely. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a provocative question. How many other people have dirty hands to show off? Uh, anyone Can you send in the chat, how long of a ribbon are you getting mm -hmm. with the samples that you're testing? Can I want to see if you're out there. Ray, would you, uh, would you mind grabbing that ruler and... Uh, oh, uh, oh, you just crushed it. Right here, right here, right here, right here. You could probably one here. do it again unless it's, unless it's too dry. One. There you go. Is it too dry? It's do you need getting a little bit all right, let me add a little bit of moisture for you. Here's a, oh. here's a, here's a ruler for you. Oh, look at that. No, uh, oh, oh, no, no oh. need, no need, oh, okay. Oh, I had better before. This is about seven centimeters. All right. Okay. And so that reassures us, as Ray was mentioning earlier, the exact answer, the correct answer is not critical. It's about getting close to a, a, an acceptable answer. And in this case, we know we're on the right side of the page down low, this would be a clay of some kind. If you get a ribbon the size of your index finger, you're mm -hmm. getting a darn nice ribbon. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, I'm gonna ask you, can you go through the process one more time and we'll make sure, sure our audience has their soil and their flow charts oh, ready. Awesome. Uh, sure thing. <laughs> Why don't we do a different It'll sample? That'd be the warm up, yeah, it's a good idea. So for our audience, make sure you have your flow charts and your soil sample ready, a little bit of water and uh, follow along with our experts here and then let us know how long your ribbon will get make you sure realize you have, they, uh, they love to get their hands sure dirty sure so. suitable See them? Towel. look at them just like make sure you dress accordingly <laughs> two kids so here you're wearing your own towel right <laughs> you want a good spoon yes pool? please Thank there you, you go yeah. sir all right we'll hang back here at the basins for the application of water minimize just how how much evidence we leave behind here ray well, 
for it's the four-way right. live staff to contend with. Yeah. Whoa. It's hard not to get a little dirty, hey, Kent? I like it. When, uh, when investigating the uh, wonders of soil? Hmm? I might have got it a little bit too wet. Oh, and so how do you rectify that? You well, add a little more add soil. Little more soil. Yes, yes. So it is a bit of a recipe, a bit like the porridge, not too hot, not too cold. In this case, not too wet, not too dry in order to form a good consistency. And of course, the more I work it, the more it should dry Some out more. as well. And uh, in this case, we're both now testing a soil that is mid-range in texture compared to the other two. We won't reveal the answer just yet, but it uh, should be evident that there's enough strength enough cohesion in the, uh, in, the, in the sample to hold a ball, yeah, to hold together. And then after that, the formation of the ribbon. Oh, this is stressful. I think, I think mine's a bit too wet. I'm going to add a little more. Here we go. This is the big test. Are you ready for this? We're ready. Oh, I don't know if I'm ready. Because <laughs> I know it. All right, you're... Attempting to form a ribbon. I'm attempting to form a ribbon. And it is forming. It is. But it doesn't look quite as stable no. or robust as that as first one. It's not as stable as the first one. Here. Oh. What was the other one? First one? Seven, seven, centimeters. seven centimeters. Oh, I'm pushing to get uh, about three centimeters three. for this one. Okay. And I don't feel like it's very stable. I would call that a weak maybe you might push it towards medium but it's a pretty weak ribbon oh mitchell Come yeah on. similarly mm -hmm. i'm having difficulty forming, forming a ribbon more than a centimeter or two and oh. and so if we refer back to the flow diagram mm -hmm. which we is can suspect it will be in uh, the lower part of the page but now rather than the right side we're probably more on the left side because the <laughs> Uh, the guidelines for ribbon length are uh, the thresholds are 2.5 centimeters and then five and then greater than five to determine whether I'm in this track, this track, or this track. And so, based on the length of ribbon that we're producing, it's uh, roughly two ish centimeters at best. So, I would say then, Kent and Ray, that we're in the first track here. And then the question of whether it is a sandy loam a silt loam or just a loam is determined by then feeling in the palm of the hand mm -hmm. with another finger here what is the nature of the individual particles if i feel grittiness then i would call Very it a sandy, sandy, loam. sandy loam if i feel smoothness or slipperiness it's it would be a uh, silty. silt loam yep. and silty. if it's neither then i would simply describe it as a loam in this case I sense a very fine grittiness. Yeah. So it'd be sandy. And so, sandy yes, loam. in terms of a final answer, mm -hmm. I agree with Ray, I would call it a sandy loam. And in this case, uh, Kent, would you, would I you would agree? I would agree. All right. And uh, in this case, we actually know the answer because I plucked this sample from the Carmen Research Station. And it is what we uh, call by name a Hibson soil series. And uh, we know uh, by soil survey and laboratory tests that it is in fact a sandy loam. Oh, sorry. So in this case, our hand texturing exercise did produce a, a result that's very close or spot on to the correct answer. Uh, but as mentioned earlier, driving to at least a reasonable answer mm -hmm. is, is what's important. In terms of one of the implications uh, of soil texture, uh, Ray has an excellent example from the world of agriculture. Basically, what we have here is the amount of water that can be stored in three feet of soil. Now, three feet is not quite a meter for all you metric people out there, okay? So basically, this is our soil sample, and you'll see this is sand, and it can only hold about 3.6 inches of water. Loam in turn is 7.2 inches. And clay is 9.2, 0 inches. Now that would be directly related to the structure of each one of those. Like, don't forget sand is a large particle, so there's going to be a lot of pores running through it. Whereas clay is very small and very tight, therefore the water will not move through it nearly as rapidly. 
So the implications, if you can see this, hopefully I can get down here without breaking my legs or knees. Total amount of water required for wheat. Now wheat, if you want 60 bushels to acre, now Kent is going to talk about what size an acre is. I think it's Kent, is it not? And a bushel. But that's a pretty good yield of wheat. And what it requires is 17 inches or 43 centimeters. So therefore, what they're hoping for is the difference here, okay, of whatever type of soil you're growing, hopefully rainfall and also snow melt. So the snow melting in the spring will add obviously to the moisture and also the amount of rainfall. So if you have very little snowfall, then you have a summer with very little rain, you're going to have a big time trouble trying to find 60 bushels per acre of wheat. All right, so it has direct implications to agriculture. Yeah, yield potential. Exactly. Yield potential, yes. And yield potential is how many bushels you're getting. And then how much a farmer is going to invest to try to achieve that yield right. in the way right. of resources, yeah. one of which Kent will address later. Farming is a big business, huge business, and it's got a very fine line of profit. Okay, so farmers are always worried about this very much. Okay. I have uh, one other illustration before we leave texture, Ray, and this mm -hmm. is a well-used map of Agri-Manitoba. It shows the surface texture of soils in different parts of our farm, predominantly farm landscape. And uh, to relate to a couple of the examples that we showed you today in the hand texturing exercise, the coarse textured soil, the high sand content example that I was working with at the start. So you can see from the map, this uh, gold color referring to coarse gravelly sand, fine sand, sands and loamy sands, most prevalent in the Carberry area associated with the Assiniboine Delta Aquifer. And uh, to relate to what Ray was just discussing, one of the implications of soil type and soil texture the type of farming and crop production that can be done. This is our uh, major potato growing region yeah. mm -hmm. because potatoes tend to do better in a, in a coarser textured soil mm -hmm. that doesn't become too wet and mucky. But uh, the catch, as Ray illustrated, is that a sand won't hold on to as much water as a clay. So and thus farmers need to make up the difference with for what irrigation. nature does not provide in mm -hmm. irrigation. Right. And then by contrast, the first sample that Kent was working with the first uh, sample that Kent conducted the hand texturing exercise on was from, he said, Morris, the Red River Valley. Here we have the city of Winnipeg marked in this dark green area, fine or clay texture. And uh, historically, we, uh, we know this to relate to the uh, presence of glacial Lake Agassiz. And as Ray was explaining earlier with that uh, that uh, settling test that can be done. The sand is heaviest, so it settles out first. Imagine Glacial Lake Agassiz here, extending as far as the Carberry area in Western Manitoba. The heaviest particles settle out first. Those are the sands. And thus, at the center of the lake, where the water was deepest, of uh, contrast to the beach, what settles out are the smallest particles. And hence, we have very fine textured or clay soils in the Red River Valley. And uh, that means that in this case, water holding capacity is not a concern. What is uh, uh, could be the, uh, the problem of excess moisture in years that are too rainy, too much snow melt, and that can lead to uh, a risk of drown out to the crop. All right, so that was texture. That's one of the properties. Another property is the color of the soil. Now this is a book called the Soil color charts, the Munsell chart. Now, this book is expensive, okay? And we're just gonna show you quickly an example of how it can be used. I think this book is roughly around $300, but if we quickly switch to Manitoba soil area, the 10YR, you can see the different types of colors here. And these different types of colors will help you to determine the soil type, all right? You see that? Now, you can see that there's a dark brown, a light, lighter brown, etc. different shades there. 
generally what you can think of it is that the darker it is, the more organic matter you would find in there. The lighter color, obviously less organic matter, and it also can be related to the amount of rainfall, because if you don't have very much rainfall, you may not have as much organic matter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this can be used to help in the classification of soils. Right? Now, horizons, soil profile. I think we're quickly running out of time here, are we? Five minutes. Five minutes. Oh, we better be quick then. This is Miss Newdale. Now, Miss Newdale is a, gives us a soil profile down into the ground, okay? So, vertical soil profile. And we can then start looking at different layers. And for today, we're just going to talk about what is referred to as the A layer, and the B layer, and the C layer. And this is going to vary wherever you go across the country or within the province as well. Newdale is actually the name of our provincial soil. So Newdale soil. Now the A layer basically is made up of organic matter. So you will have in certain areas like virgin uh, uh, forest areas and uh, uh, the O layer would be the litter. But generally down and around uh, this area, etc., you won't find that. You will just find an A layer, which is basically made up of decomposers, etc., etc. The B layer will contain a lot of the minerals, etc., because they will have been washed out of the A layer down into the B layer. The C layer, in turn, is basically your, you can think of it as your bedrock. So these are your three horizons. Now, there's a little uh, activity we can do very quickly. What I've got here is, I'll just quickly show it. This is nothing more than a chart that you can actually uh, photocopy into this type of uh, heavier paper. You then can cut out the cards. Then what you do is you take some two-sided carpet tape and you will cut it out and apply it right here within where it says <coughs> the horizons on the left hand the, the side yes, yes. <laughs> and this is where you put the tape here. Mm -hmm. So what you're going to do is basically try and gauge where to put each one. All right. If you use the New Deal soil as an example, all you do is take this down, roll it down a bit and you would put the A level in there, rub it in and dump the excess A back into this, the appropriate container. All right, the appropriate tray. And corresponding roughly to the depth rate. Right. In reality versus uh, what's uh, marked on the miniature monolith. Right. Yeah. So in this case, I'm going to peel the top of the double-sided tape down to approximately 20 centimeters. 20. Okay. Something less than the 30 anyway. Okay. And then I'll take a small amount of the darkest horizon, the A horizon. And then, without exposing the lower part of the tape, sprinkle the A horizon sample onto that portion of the tape. Dump the excess off. Dump the excess. If you have it too thick, for instance, it won't go through the laminator. This uh -huh. is a laminator. Yes, for the take home option. Yes. So what happens sometimes, what I use to clean up this soil quite often is just an ordinary sifter. And you sift the soil so it's nice and fine. If you don't, if you have little wee pebbles or anything in there, then this will be too thick. You run it through the laminator and then you got a problem. It's jammed, etc., etc. So please try and keep it as smooth as you can. I've now applied, Ray, a sample of the B after peeling right down the tape. And now, lastly, I can peel back the rest mm -hmm. and apply the C horizon. And I'm going to need more of that because there is more, more C. More C. Yes, because that's the original parent material from which the soil formed. And, of course, the soil has formed from the top down through precipitation and the growing, the, the life mm -hmm. of organisms, and then their demise and their breakdown. 
you should find that the B layer, transitionary layer, is probably the most colorful one. In some cases, you may not even find a B layer. Yes, and this relates, right. uh, Ray, circles us back uh, to the yeah. original portion of your lesson, which was soil formation, that uh, colors are one of the manifestation of how the soil forming factors mm -hmm. have operated differently. As I mentioned, the darkest horizon at the top, because that's where the living things eventually yeah. died and formed organic matter. And then, uh, as you illustrated with the, the landscape figure, the degree to which water moves down through the soil washes uh, certain types of constituents, yeah. soluble things, Downwards. partially soluble Downwards. things, like the carbonates down through the soil profile. And depending on which part of the landscape uh, we're examining, uh, the soil may be more or less developed as a result of that downward movement of water, and there mm -hmm. may or may not be a bee. Okay, so I think we're running out of time. This is just an example where I took a bunch of, of the cards together, put them on one sheet, ran it through the laminator, and then I had students basically cut out each individual one. They could put their name on it, and lo and behold, they have their own uh, soil profile through the minnow monolith. Okay, I think we're done. All right, I want to thank you all. I hope we got some, some information out to you, sorry. Okay, everyone, we will be back in 15 minutes at 11 o'clock with our next soil station. So take a break and come on back at 11 o'clock. Thank you, bye-bye. Hi, everyone, welcome back. Thanks for staying tuned in. So next up, we have Mr. Kent Lewarn from uh, Nutrients for Life. He's going to be teaching us all about nutrients and how we can use the powers of chemistry to detect nutrients that are in the soil uh, and learn more about different types of soils and what they grow well. So I'm going to turn things over to Kent. Awesome. Thanks, Katrina. Um, just before I get started into my content, I want to warn you what you're going to need for this station, all right? So in the box that was sent to your school, uh, you should find a little bag with some nutrient samples in it. So there's one that's kind of green and white. So that bag you need to have handy. You'll also, sorry camera guy, I'm moving around. You'll also have some crop samples. Okay, so you should see four little bags with crop samples. And the big thing you're going to need this time is this little box that says NPK soil kit. And you will actually need a little bit of water, preferably distilled water, but tap water will do for today. So those are some of the things you're going to need for, for this session today. All right? So let's get started. I left home this morning at 5.30. 5.30 a.m. So I had, my, I had my lunch, I had my breakfast on the go. So I had a really nice egg McMuffin, okay? I had a nice apple, and by the way, I made this myself to do. What I'm wondering is, what did you guys have for breakfast this morning? What, did, what nutrients did you guys take in before you came to school this morning? Hammer that into Jacqueline. Did you have breakfast this morning, camera guy? Coffee, coffee that's it. Camera guy had coffee, okay? Well, I'm on a boat cup number six right now, so I totally get that. So what did you guys have for breakfast? You must have had something. And why do we need that? Why do we need those, that food first thing in the morning? What are the big things that you had? Come on, Jacqueline. Come on, people. All right, well, my daughter has decided she no longer wants toast in the mornings and only wants scrambled eggs. Oh, good choice. And we have Ethan here who had cereal this morning as well. Cereal, I like it. Ethan, we need to know what kind. Are you a Lucky Charms a or Lucky a Lucky Charms guy? All right. Well, keep those answers coming, you guys, about what you had. And tell me, tell Jacqueline, why do we need those, why do we need those foods? What are the big food groups that we need for us as humans? And why do we need that stuff, you guys? Shoot that off to Jacqueline in the chat. But you know what? It's really important to understand that plants need to eat too. So we've got, hey, Jacqueline's got a... Oh yeah, we're, we're live now. People yes. want to talk about what they're eating. I know, it's awesome. All right, so Ethan has responded that he had Fruit Loops. 
Oh, a classic. classic. I love the I love the Fruit Loops. Arif is here with his peanut butter toast. Fruit Loops have reincarnated right around my waist as <laughs> <laughs> We have peanut butter on toast from Arif. We oh, have uh, awesome. Joyce had toast and black coffee. Yes. Charlene is an oatmeal fan. Oatmeal, I like it. Sarah, coffee and granola. Yes. And uh, Taylor, oh, Taylor, a smoothie bowl and oatmeal. Oh, mm -hmm. the big breakfast. So we get those nutrients, you guys, because we're taking those in. We, we ingest it through our mouth and we digest it and it turns it into the things Oh, you're good? Oh, you're talking to him. Oh, I thought you were talking to me, okay. Me and the camera guys, we're gonna, we're gonna have a little tussle here, I think. All right, so we, we change the, that food into the nutrients our bodies need. So my question to you now is, what are the big nutrients that plants need? If, if plants need food too, tell me, what do they need to grow? What are the big nutrients that plants require? Go. I got a long wait time. Jacqueline's, Jacqueline's on hold. Jacqueline's coming. Jacqueline's got nothing. All right, we've got uh, yes. a couple. <laughs> uh, Ethan uh, said sunlight. Sunlight, yeah, plants do need sunlight, that's for sure. Um, but sunlight's not a nutrient. So thank you, Ethan, that's so true. But what are the what are the nutrients that the that the plants need to get? All right, the we've got food. a few. We've got yes. a few. Uh, Taylor has indicated that plants need potassium nitrogen. Oh, potassium! I like that. Joyce, phosphorus nitrogen. and water. Yes. You guys are awesome. Charlene, nitrogen. Yes. Taylor, phosphorus. Excellent. Joyce, carbon. Yes. We're on a roll, people. All right. So. Plants need, plants need all of those things. So plants need nitrogen. And in your, in your tickle trunk of stuff, I sent you a little package of nitrogen. This is commercial nitrogen. So it's the little white pellets. And I know this is gonna seem like a BFO, a blinding flash of the obvious, but I labeled it nitrogen, okay? Um, phosphorus, absolutely. So, sorry, I should go back to nitrogen. Nitrogen is one of the major macronutrients. We, it, we need it for plant growth, we need it for photosynthesis. Uh, nitrogen is one of the major components of, of building proteins. Nitrogen, huge macronutrient. Somebody said phosphorus. Phosphorus, early growth, root growth. Absolutely an essential nutrient. Phosphorus comes from the ancient seas where, it's, where we're mining it. Um, we also need potassium. Potassium. Kind of ironic, it's the letter K and not a P, because P was already used up. So potassium is the symbol K. Okay, somebody tell me, what's the element that, what's the name of the element potassium's named after? Why did we get a K in there? I need to know, okay? And those are the three big macronutrients. We call them NPK, okay? K, okay? And in, in your bag, I actually put a, a sample. This is the rock that's mined, and the province next door to us, Saskatchewan Rough Riders, okay, it actually, <laughs> the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, Saskatchewan actually produces, it's like 46, 49% of the potassium in the world is coming from Saskatchewan, which is kind of crazy. I'm gonna throw out one more macronutrient for you. Um, some crops really also need sulfur, okay? Particularly canola, which we grow a ton of canola in, in Manitoba, uh, in Canada. So sulfur is a big one for those. But yes, those are the major macronutrients. So how do these plants get these macronutrients? How do they get them into, the, into their bodies, into the plant? Where, how do they do that? Come on, people, tell me. Jacqueline's on her phone. I know she's. I know she's answering. She's sending in the answer right now. Oh, I gotta wrap up my egg McMuffin because I still need to eat that on the way home. Okay, so as yes. we wait for um, people to respond, you might want to repeat the question. Oh, 
How do plants get the nutrients they need into the plant or into their bodies? How do they absorb the nutrients? All right. So as we wait for that, I do have a story about one of our participants. Here. Yes. My science coach partner, Arif Kassam, um, stellar uh, science teacher. And when he was in the classroom, his class would call him Mr. Potassium. Mr. Potassium. Instead so, of Mr. K. So because we're all a bunch of science nerds like that. I like that. Yeah. So I we like do it. have an answer, or a, an answer with a question mark. She's wondering if it's, uh, Joyce is wondering if it's through roots. Yeah, absolutely. So we do, we do get the, I, I got to, here, zoom in. Come on, zoom me. Okay, so plants actually absorb all their nutrients through their roots, which means, and the, here's a tough one for you. If plants are absorbing all their nutrients through their roots, where are plants getting their food from? From within this dark stuff, which is kind of what Mr. Cochran was talking about last station. What, where are plants getting all the nutrients from? Starts with an S. You're not, you don't have to tell me. He's like, yes, I do. All right, it's coming, I know it's coming. Okay. We have an answer. We have an answer. Soil? Yes! Awesome! So plants are getting all of these nutrients from the soil. So if we're taking all the nutrients out of the soil, how do I make sure I can keep growing crops year after year after year? That's my next question for you. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. How do farmers replenish? How do we the replenish soil? the yes, soil so if the food, right? Yeah. I am confident that these students are experts. I, I hear you. Taylor is answering with crop rotation. Oh, great choice. Great choice. Uh, Taylor's also saying that legumes replenish nitrogen. Yes. Joyce is saying legumes for nitrogen fixation and crop rotation. Yes. Brett, crop rotation and zero till. Oh, zero tills in there. Mitchell's, these guys we're, we're going to get there. Oh, awesome answers. There's different things we can add to the soil. So these are, these are commercial fertilizers. So we have nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, but we don't always have to add commercial products. There's other products we can add. Look at this yummy looking stuff right here. Camera guy, zoom in. Zoomy. Oh yes, the homemade kind of fertilizer. Okay, kind. so we can add this lovely looking stuff. Okay, and this one, it's got a lot of straw in it because this one is beef manure. Ooh, yeah. come on. Okay, what are some other sources of nutrients though besides beef manure? Well, this one, this one's really liquidy. Okay, and it comes from pigs. Pig manure, we can apply that as well. Or, uh, oh, I, I'm just gonna leave this one hanging. Can also use this. This is called biosolids. Where do we get biosolids from? I'm gonna leave that one for the chat, okay? I'm not gonna tell you where this one's from. But these are also sources of nutrients. Um, some of them are used on, in commercial agriculture. Some of them are not used on food products. Okay, but all of those things, food comes in and basically food's coming out. Okay, the food's coming out for our plants to use. Oh, that was bad. Okay, so. This is my booby trap for you, Kent. I apologize. Thanks. So next question for you. Okay, you got a lot of questions to answer here. I hope you're keeping up, all right? So the next question for you, okay, is how much of this stuff do I need to apply? How much do I have to replenish in the soil, okay, year after year after year? And that's kind of a rhetorical question because I'm gonna tell you the answer, okay? Or I'm gonna work towards that. All right, camera guy, are you ready for this? I'm making a shift. Yeah, he's ready, he says, yes, I'm ready. All right, so if you look down in front of me, okay, there is a basket and 
that basket contains little wee tiny dark seeds. Any guesses what that is, you guys? Throw her in the chat, okay? So that's a basket of canola. I'm telling you the answer now, all right? But I wanna ask you about the basket because the basket is actually kind of a special measurement. What do we call this basket? How big is this basket is my question for you, okay? So camera guy, now zoom up here, zoomy. To make that one basket of canola, here is how much nutrients I needed. I need these two pop bottles of nitrogen. I need this, well, about two thirds of a pop bottle of phosphorus. I need about uh, three quarters of a pop bottle of potassium and about half a pop bottle of sulfur. I need all of this to make one basket of canola. Has anybody told me about my special basket yet? Yes. yes. So um, when you had asked what type of uh, crop that is, Brett did correctly guess that it was canola. Awesome, Brett. And Brett also is saying that it might be a bushel. Brett, you're on a roll. Whoever Brett's teacher is, pass that kid. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. So, so that is called a bushel basket. Okay, and originally a bushel was a unit of volume, okay, and so if you had that basket full of anything, that would be one bushel, all right? So that is one bushel of canola right there. Beside it, we have one bushel of soybeans, and look at what the soybeans need. They need this bottle of potassium, this bottle of phosphorus, and this bottle of sulfur. What's missing? What aren't the soybeans requiring that the canola is requiring a lot of? The white stuff. What? The honest Mitchell. Soybean does not need nitrogen? Well, it does need nitrogen, oh, but trick question, come trick on, question. the big setup. Okay, it does need nitrogen, but it's really cool because the, oh, I gotta come zoomy. I don't, oh, this is going to be a tough zoomy. Okay. Can you can you see those tiny little nodules, cam, camera guy? Those tiny little nodules contain bacteria, and the bacteria in there are really special. They can actually take nitrogen out of the air, and they convert it into forms that the plant can use. You guys have already told me this. You talked about legumes already. You nailed it. Okay, so it's not that soybeans don't need nitrogen, it's that they get it in a different way. Awesome, cool. Okay, back to... All right, so, I, go, I gotta get here. Oh, well, I'm, I'm okay. Tony, yes. You're okay, Ken. I'm good. You're okay. I, I'm checking the time, because sometimes I talk a lot. Not you. Honest, Jacqueline. I, I, like, I know it's hard to believe. All right, so, I gotta ask you, have you ever heard of something called an acre? How big is an acre? Dun dun dun, dun 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 dun. Come on, somebody, type to Jacqueline and tell her, what is an acre? I can't wait too long or I'm gonna run out of my 28 minutes. Is it an expression of mass? It is not. Oh, what about uh, volume? Is it an expression of volume? It is not volume oh, either. Let's see. Come it's on, how heavy. come on, chat people. It's not how much. Oh, Jacqueline's gonna bail me out. Well, Joyce believes it's the area equivalent to 100 square meters. Oh. Oh, Joyce, you were so close. On the right track though. You, Joyce, you have brilliantly defined a hectare. So a hundred square meters is a hectare. And much of the world actually measures land area in hectares. But we're on? Yeah. G price. G price. 400 square meters. Oh, too big. So uh, an acre is an, it's an area. Okay. 
and it's an area in the imperial system, and it's, it's an area of roughly 208 feet square. Okay, so ballpark, it's about the size of a football field. Okay, so you get an idea how big an acre is. So what I want to know is, if I'm going to grow canola on that acre, how many baskets of canola can I grow on that acre of ground? Okay, now in our, in our area, I'm just going to say, and Mitchell can correct me on this one, a decent crop of canola is probably 40 to 60. Yes, farmers would be pushing for the 50 to 60 now. Yeah, yes, like in our time. area, on one acre, one football field, they're growing 50 baskets. Okay, 50 baskets. But that means that one acre needs 50 times this many nutrients. So if all these nutrients are being taken out, do I have to add all this much back in? And the answer is no. Some of this, some of this does leave with the seeds. We've got a distribution issue here, people. All these seeds that are leaving, all this canola that we're shipping are, is taking nutrients with it. But some of this, the residue, so the parts of the crop that, that isn't shipped away, goes back on the field, and we've got these great little bacteria that Ray talked about in the soil, all the microorganisms that are breaking it down so it's there to use next year. That's awesome, okay? You talked about soybeans. Soybeans actually, well, they have bacteria that are producing or they're taking nitrogen from the air, okay, which is the N2, and they're turning it into a form we can use. Awesome. So, you guys, I'm really confused. We want to grow a different crop. We know that nutrients will be taken away. How do I know how much nutrients I need to add? From year to year, how do I know how many nutrients I need to put back on my field? Yeah. I guess. Thanks, Ray. No, I don't guess. I'm a science guy. I'm a science nerd. Okay. And by the way, agronomists are some of the nerdiest of science nerds. Okay. So sorry, all the agronomy people out there, but like we're right up there. All right. So how do I figure out how much nutrients I need to apply? I absolutely have to. Use I use magic. No, I absolutely have to do some soil testing. So Mitchell, camera guy, we're over here now. Okay, so Mitchell has a soil test probe. So we're going to go out in the field and we're going to test, we're going to push this probe into the ground and we're going to pull out a sample from the zero to six inch range. We're going to pop it in a bag and we're going to ship it off to get tested. And we're going to pull a sample from 6 inches to 24 inches because the roots will grow pretty low. And we're going to ship that away to get tested. Okay? And we're going to do it at this time of year. And we're at a perfect Timing time right perfect. now. Yeah, just like what you okay? can see in the bucket here. In our area, most of the combining is done. So all the crops have been taken off. They're just getting ready to think about next year now. Doing a little bit of fall work. All right, so we're going to sample the soil and we're going to send it off to a lab and we're going to get it analyzed. All right, and when I, when I do that, it's kind of like getting a report card. So I get a report card back that says, oh, here's what's in your soil. And it also then recommends, well, if I want to grow beans next year, pinto beans, Here's my recommendations of what I need to be adding to my soil. Well, what if I want to grow spring wheat? Here's my recommendations for growing spring wheat. And well, what if I decide I want to grow corn? So here's my recommendations if I want to grow corn. Just hold that there for a second because there's a bit of a glare. I'm holding that there because there's a bit of a glare. Hey, that rhymes. Gee, Kent, you're a poet and have no idea that you are one. I
More? Much clearer. Much clearer. Zoomy? So you guys, there's a ton of different companies that will, that will produce this type of report for you. This one is an example from a company called Agvice. But there's lots of sample, lots of different companies that will analyze the samples. Down? Him? Okay. But that's what, that's what the report card looks like. Okay. So here's kind of your marks right now if we're, if we're comparing this to your report card. Here's your marks right now. And here's kind of the recommendations about what you need to do to improve. Okay. So it gives you an idea. And for a, for a grain report card, uh, instead of like math, science, right? Now you're doing nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, okay? And you're getting all of your results. Okay, time for you guys to get to work. Okay, we're going back. Oh, look at that. We, we are on a roll. Okay. In your box, you should have a soil test kit. And you had a Ziploc bag that actually had a number of soil samples in it. So we're going to start with, and I, I highly recommend you start with sand. Okay, so there's one in there that's labeled sand. There's one that's labeled uh, sandy loam, okay, or just loam. And then on the, on the uh, Ziploc bag, I wrote SL, and that stands for sandy loam. So that one will be second. And then there's one that says clay, and that one I would do third. I recommend, totally up to you and your teacher, I recommend you work in groups of four. Because in your kit, you're going to find a large extraction tube, and you'll find some tabs that actually say Flock X. So these are extraction tablets. And you'll find three test tubes, one for nitrogen, and you have a set of tabs that says nitrate, Okay, and one for phosphorus and one for potassium. So I recommend one person sort of on each tube and you're going to need some distilled water. So here's my extraction tube. It's got a snap cap on it. Okay, I'm going to take the top off my squirty bottle and I'm going to fill it up to the 30 milliliter line. By the way, in your kit, you also have this wonderful little thing called directions. Okay, directions. So it says fill up to the, to the 30 mil line with distilled water, add two Flock X tablets. So in my, in my box of goodies, I'm going to pull out two tablets. I'm going to read and make sure it says Flock X on it, so I'm adding the right tablets. And I'm going to add two of them, okay, to my container. And I'm going to mix until the tablets disintegrate. So just mix back and forth, make sure the cap's on, okay, or it's really embarrassing, especially on the camera. So I'm going to mix it until the tablets disintegrate. And then I'm going to add, and I'm going to move this out front so you can see it. I'm going to add a heaping teaspoon of soil. Now I'll be honest with you, I found I was using an actual teaspoon, okay, like a, and I found it was too big to fit in this, in this container. So I switched to a half teaspoon, and guess what I did? I'm such a crazy person. I added two half teaspoons. I know, that's crazy. Sci like, science is insane. Okay, so, I, like, oh, Katrina's never having me back. So two, so two, <laughs> Okay, now they're getting me giggling. So two half teaspoons. Whoa, that was craziness. Okay, and I'm gonna mix. All right, oh. get that out of the road. 
And it says I want to mix for one minute. And you really do want to do that, okay? You really want to mix for a minute. I'm in a bit of a hurry up offense, so I probably am not going to wait a minute. And then I'm going to let it sit to settle. Would you like us to mix for you? No. I want you to just, just sit here. Okay. Somebody, did anybody answer my potassium question, where, where that element name came from, and why the symbol is K? Nobody responded. I'm kind of hurt. I'm kind of hurt. Okay. All right. Now, one of the reasons I said I recommend you start with the sand is look how quick it settled. It, it settles so quick because, and Ray talked about this, sand are huge particles. So they just fell out of the solution. All right. But what happened here, the water now has that extracting tablet dissolved and it's pulling the nutrients out of the soil, okay? So now the nutrients have been pulled out of the sand sample, the soil sample, and they're in the liquid, okay? So that's the liquid now I'm gonna use in each of my test tubes. So you've got three tests, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. So for the nitrogen test, it says use the pipette. So the pipette is the dropper thingy, okay? So the dropper thingy that's in the kit, I'm gonna use the pipette and I want to fill it above the shoulder, okay? And so the shoulder is right up here, so you're actually gonna fill it right up pretty much to the top. Oh, this is gonna be bad. Now, you do wanna be careful when you're removing the solution that you don't stir up the bottom. Are you guys doing this? Are you following along or am I just doing this and you guys are sitting back looking pretty, thinking about lunch, okay? Somebody, somebody tell me if you're actually doing this. Make sure I got the nitrate tabs. All right, we have a couple answers about the uh, potassium Oh, question. yes. Wataru said that K represents callium. Excellent. And Joyce uh, said she used Google, but it's the Latin word callium, which is potash in English. It is. Which is what the name potassium originates from. Perfect. Thank you, you guys. And if you ever drive on number one highway past Regina, just a little bit west of Regina, you actually drive by a road that's named Callium Road because it, you drive on it and you get right to a potash mine. Pot I went to a mine in Rokenville for a tour. Unbelievable. It's like a city under the ground in a potash mine. And uh, I don't have the full name, but KN1T uh, admits that we're just thinking about lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Me, hey, do you want an Egg McMuffin? Like, I have an extra one, okay? Uh, and I, I totally get it. I'm thinking about lunch too, okay? Katrina has promised us lunch. New restaurant here at Fort White Alive open today. Today's opening day. All right, so I've got the nitrogen mixed up. You now have, you, you've got the rest of your sample. You've got two more people. So you should be now filling up their potassium tube to the right mark, okay? And the, uh, sorry, the phosphorus tube to the right mark, the potassium tube to the right mark. And you're going to, the, the nitrogen one has to wait for a few minutes, but then you're going to compare the tubes to the color card, okay? So once my time is up, I'm going to compare it to the colors on the color card and try and determine if I have low nitrogen, medium nitrogen, or high nitrogen in my soil sample. Because if the nitrogen's there already, I don't need to add as much. I like that, okay? But if the nitrogen's not there, nitrogen's a big one. Nitrogen really helps determine yield, okay? So if you're lacking nitrogen, your yield is going to suffer. And why do we care about yield? Well, yield is how we make money, okay? And sometime we gotta think that it's about economics as well. We're trying to produce as much food as we can on the, on the land that we have. And if I'm a farmer, I'm trying to feed my family. I want to make as much money as I can. All right. How are we doing? Uh, well, Waterhen School is busy doing their testing. I like Waterhen School. And Gabby would like the Egg McMuffin. <laughs> <laughs> Gabby, it's, well, I should ship it up there. We'll see how it is. Okay. Awesome. So that is our nitrogen test. 
and hopefully you can get some more tests going. I think everybody also got a little Ziploc with some extra testing equipment in it. So you, if you've got more than four people, you can, you can actually get the next soil sample going as well. So I recommend, hopefully you're doing the sand right now. Then I would go to the, to the sandy loam. Okay, it's labeled loam in your bag. And finally, I would do the, the clay sample that's there. Um, because clay takes forever to settle out. So you might, you might even have to leave it overnight and actually get back to it tomorrow when you're looking at it. All right. You guys, any questions about soil testing? Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, I have a challenge for our oh. virtual audience. Um, Kent is asking if you have any questions. I want you to try to stump Kent. Oh, hang Think on. Of your difficult question. <laughs> that, that, was, <laughs> that was nasty. Okay. So while you guys are doing your testing, all right, I'm, I just want to show you some of my geeky science models. Okay, so, and I'm, I'm thinking now about this nitrogen fertilizer. What is the main ingredient in this nitrogen fertilizer? And don't say nitrogen, because I know that's there in there. But these white pellets, what is it called? Dun, 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 dun. No, no hints. I'll give you a hint, it starts with a U. Wow, I was going to do that. And it looks like this. Zoomy guy, can you zoomy? It looks like this. So, for us geeky chemistry people, okay, red is oxygen, black is carbon, blue is nitrogen, so there's two blues, and white is hydrogen, okay? So, this is the molecule that's in this, these white pellets. Dun, dun, dun. It starts with a U. You guys are all making it right now yourselves. No, Katrina, you cannot answer. <laughs> I know you want to, but you can't. You're making this. Your, your kidneys are filtering it out. Okay, I'm going to leave we, it there. We have an answer from Taylor. Yes, Taylor. Urea. Urea, perfect. <laughs> we also have some questions once you're ready for them. I'm ready. Stumpers. Oh, okay. Well, good thing Ray's here. Mitchell ditched oh. me. Okay. First question from Sarah. Should all farms do this or just large farms? Oh, good question. Um, you know what? In agriculture, we talk about best management practices. And best management practices are what you on your farm can sustain and do. So at, you should try and do as many good things for, the, for sustainable agriculture as you possibly can. Can everybody do what we're talking about today? Probably not. Um, the equipment is really, really expensive. So where we're going with everything we're talking about today is something that's called variable rate technology. It's, you have to have the equipment that will allow you to apply the nitrogen only where it's needed. The phosphorus where it's needed. And that equipment is really expensive. Is everybody able to do that? Probably not. Um, bigger farms, probably that equipment, new equipment that they're buying probably has that capability built in. So, no, not every farm is doing this. Some farmers are, some farms are using manure. And manure is, it's great but it's hard to control what nutrients are, are in that manure. And the nitrogen is coming with phosphorus with it, right? You're not keeping, you can't keep them separate anymore. But if you're using manure, practices are getting better too. We used to apply phosphorus manure. We just spread it on the surface. We don't do that anymore. Now we actually take, take it and we inject it into the ground so that it's not there for next spring. So that's a best management practice. 
So that's a, that's a great question, but it's a really hard one to answer. Anything that... Well, he, they can't hear you. Give the recommendations to the farmer. It's the farmer's land. It's his business. And they'll take what they want to use and go from there. All you can do is give the recommendations, give them the information, et cetera, et cetera, and hopefully they'll pick up and, as Ken said, best management practices. Okay, can we have an easier question? That was a hard one. You cannot have an easier question. Oh. Taylor has stepped up as well here. Oh, Taylor. Do you think that livestock waste is an efficient way to get nutrients back into the soil, taking into consideration all the nutrients and resources it takes to grow and maintain the animals in the first place? Oh, Very well thought of. That, that's an awesome question. Uh, it goes to the, uh, there's multiple issues embedded throughout that question. If, if animal agriculture is going to occur, we have to manage the waste. And one of the ways to manage the waste is for application on a field. So the nutrients that, that were used to raise these cattle is being returned to the land. Um, so yes, the, the nutrients from, from the manure, it, it's great. Okay. Uh, typically it's, a, it's less expensive. Um, and if it's your own farm, it's, it's a free source of nutrients, uh, coming from, from the animals. So yeah, it's a great source of nutrients. Uh, question from Joyce. How possible is it that we can reuse nutrients by using dead plants to create fertilizer using the remaining nutrients inside of that plant? Oh, um, okay, I'm, I'm, I want to make sure I understand the question okay, right. Okay, the way I understand so, it is um, we're reusing nutrients inside of dead plants to create fertilizer. So uh, the organic materials, I suppose. So related to that, phosphorus is being pulled out of, out, of different, out of different sources. So you can get the phosphorus from the manure, but there's actually a process where you can pull phosphorus out of the, out of the waste effluent, and that phosphorus can then be used. Um, pulling it out of the plants, that's what's happening over winter. So when the plants die over winter, the grass in the ditch, the tree leaves that have fallen down, when those, when those die and decay over winter, because we've got this crazy season called winter, where stuff freezes and cells rupture, then that phosphorus is being, available, being made available next spring. Unfortunately, we're not harnessing that. Uh, so it's all flowing in around our watershed next spring. Uh, most of the phosphorus, and Mitchell's going to get on, like, you're setting this up for the next presentation. This is awesome, because Mitchell's going to talk about what's happening with that phosphorus next spring. Um, I think her question was, can we harness that? Can we start to pull that phosphorus out? And I hope Mitchell will address that, because I can't. So, yeah, I can, so, I can chime in if you like. No. Uh, it'll no. be no. your no. turn yeah, for absolutely. that this afternoon. Here. But are you saying that Oh, Kent, you're mic'd up? Kent, are you saying that we stumped you? Oh, absolutely not. I, it's an issue that I'd like to take under advisement with my <laughs> consulting uh, colleague. And I, I'd like to get some input from Mr. Timmerman here. Sure. I, if following the question correctly, yes, I think uh, what the student may be asking about is uh, addressed by crop rotation. Uh, and what's left behind in the, the residue that's not harvested, that will return some nutrients to the land. And uh, that, do you happen to have the mini bales, Kent? Mm -hmm. If you happen to have the mini bales, I see them over there at the blue lid. That is uh, something that we talk to farmers about as to the question of what happens to that residue, whether or not it's entirely left on the field, or if the farmer will, as Kent is about to illustrate, uh, if the farm will remove that residue as a bale and then perhaps uh, sell it to another farmer or use it on that farm, depending on whether or not there is livestock. For instance, use the straw as bedding. Uh, the other way this could come into play would be organic versus conventional agriculture. What the student may be referring to is growing a what's called green manure crop. Yeah. And that is a crop that is terminated or killed when it's green and then worked into the soil so that the nutrients that it contains will then fertilize the next crop. 
The catch is, one may ask, well, then why aren't all farmers doing it? Through their crop rotations and managing their residue, farmers are doing it to some degree in each case. But the contrast uh, between the two sources is availability, plant availability. How quickly will the nutrients become available to the next crop? Synthetic fertilizers provide a source with great confidence, formulated, manufactured, hence they cost a lot of money. The so-called free, not really free, not but, really I know what free but I know what you're getting at, the homemade or scented fertilizers are another readily available <laughs> source where they are made on certain farms. And uh, they provide, depending on which formulation, will provide nutrients uh, with a certain amount of confidence, with less so than synthetic fertilizers, relying on a green manure crop or the nutrients coming out of the residue creates more uncertainty for the farmer. And as well, to grow a green manure crop in an organic system means no making no money in the year that that crop is grown. That's all about investing in the next crop year. All right, thank you. So we are just about out of time, but we do have Ready? two stellar questions. Oh, but I got stuff. Okay, stellar questions. First, short answer. Um, what do Every you think, answer I give is short. What do you think about the new idea of trying vertical Something farming like to this. minimize land use? I love the idea of vertical farming. Um, I've, I've tried tower gardens. Uh, I, think, I think for, for cities, you're going to see more and more vertical vertical farming, um, especially for vegetables, uh, things things that in Canada we can't get in the winter time. So I think you're going to see more and more of it happening, um, in our particularly in our cities. Okay, and last question: uh, During winter decay, can we collect the phosphorus because it's causing eutrophication since it's just running down the watershed? Can we then collect that runoff and reuse it? Or would it be bioaccumulation like down? Right at this point, we're not collecting it. It's, it's the plants are dying, they're decaying. The runoff is, it, 80% of it's, Mitchell's gonna talk about how much of the runoff is happening in the spring, during spring runoff. Um, is there potential for that in the future? Yeah, I think, that, I think there is. Uh, just I'm not sure how we're how we're going to do that. And the, the great part about Canadian agriculture is there's so much jobs and so much potential that you guys are going to actually solve these questions for us. Okay, you can't stop me yet because okay, I got to show them this. All right. So once you've done all your testing, you've got the test results back from the lab. Okay, they've given you your report card, but they will actually now start writing a prescription for you. Just, just like a prescription when you go to the doctor, but they write a prescription saying, hey, this area right here, it needs a different amount of nitrogen than the area that's red. And so with variable rate technology, we can apply the nitrogen right where we need it. We apply the phosphorus right where we need it so that we're growing as much food as we can. If this corner of my field over here never grows anything, why would I spend a whole bunch of money putting seed there, putting nitrogen, phosphorus there, okay? I'm only gonna put these nutrients where we need them. And that's the benefit of variable rate agriculture, okay? Why is that important? Okay, I gotta do this. Why is that important? Because remember this urea, okay? If all of this is getting converted into, into um, nitrogen that the plant is using, we don't produce this. This guy is called nitrous oxide. It's 300 times as potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So one of these equals 300 carbon dioxides. Do we want this turning into this? All of you shake your heads, go absolutely not. And the way we do that is by making sure that all of this is being used by the plants that they were intended to feed. Because those plants need to eat too, so let's make sure we feed them, but let's feed them right. Okay, I'm done. Thank you so much, Mr. LaVorne. That was fantastic. Uh, we will be back on at one o'clock. So you have a lunch break until then. We won't be on air again until one o'clock. So tune back in for more. We're gonna learn about water and soil and how they interact on the land. Oh. 
I guess it's lunchtime. All right, we'll see you later. Hi, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. Good to have you back for our afternoon of soil and water day here at Fort White Alive. Our first afternoon session uh, is called the Amazing Rain and Snow Show. We're going to be learning about how water and the land interact and some of the big questions that we have about how soil or things from soil can end up in our waterways will be answered. We have uh, Mitchell Timmerman here doing this station. He's an agri-ecosystem specialist uh, with Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development. He also goes by Dirt Nerd. So only he is allowed to use the word dirt though, otherwise we're gonna talk about soil. So I'm gonna pass it over to Mitchell. He is just finishing a couple of setup things here. You can pan the camera over and we'll see what he's got to show us. Now it's turned on. Testing one, two, coming through all right? Excellent. Right, hello again, everyone. My name is Mitchell and I'm with the Provincial Agriculture and Resource Development Department, as Katrina mentioned. I'm gonna be calling upon my esteemed Nutrients for Life colleague, Kent LaWarren, who is uh, claiming to be done and home free. He's not completely off the hook as uh, I would like uh, to use his services to illustrate uh, certain visuals. Kent, if you would be at the ready when called upon. Uh, what I have here for you folks today is what uh, we like to call in fun language, not necessarily always appropriate for serious people like farmers and agronomists, uh, but for teachers and students and people like us who know dirt, playing in the dirt can be fun and there's lots of exciting learning to be had. Uh, we call this the Amazing Rain and Snow Show. Are you TAR SS. Are you suitably? Yeah, that acronym doesn't work very well, does it? Oh. Kent? No. All right, I know I'm with the government, so I should be all about the acronyms. Uh, we're going to start from left to right, uh, to, for the benefit of the camera operators, with a focus first on water movement. How water behaves on the agricultural landscape. This will be an emphasis uh, for uh, folks viewing from uh, northern locations on agricultural Manitoba, or what we call agri-Manitoba. And uh, of course the dynamics are, are quite different up to the north, but some of the same principles apply. So we're gonna talk about water movement and link to the soil properties that Ray uh, presented to begin the day, and then the nutrition uh, provided uh, in the form of fertilizers containing nutrients, as Kent explained, in order to replenish agricultural fields in order to grow crops every year and then link to uh, uh, follow through then on farmer practice uh, address something called 4R or introduce something called 4R nutrient stewardship or the 4Rs of using fertilizer sustainably and then that should segue nicely into uh, Sarah's topic to wrap the day which is uh, impacts on water quality and uh, some of those are attributable to agriculture and so we need to look with a critical eye at how food production is done, what farmers can and can't control and help them to do a better job where possible. And so Kent, to begin here, thanks to you in part and with my own kit, we have the rain portion of the Amazing Rain and Snow Show. Here we have for you folks, simulated farm fields still primarily a simulation. We call this a rainfall simulator, Kent, because it's not an experiment and it's not necessarily perfectly representing conditions out in the field. However, for the most part, we have obtained intact slices of soil and thus when we subject them to a simulated rainfall, uh, we are able to produce results that uh, are at least mostly valid or to your critical eye, uh, you will decide how valid they are for what we would expect where we're answering the question, where will the water flow? Will it go in this direction primarily or that direction? And thinking then about the influence farmers can have on that water movement. Alrighty, so we'll begin with field one on the far left. And uh, Kent, this is where you come into play. Oh. First off, you may recall these signs. Oh, these are hard. For the full, the full size one, going to focus on the crop related Labels and yeah, these are 
extensively used, and thus, uh, yeah, they are, you can use the word dirty. I haven't cleaned them up entirely, so the camera operators will tell us if there's any problem with, um, I got a really need one of those, good. If there's any problem with visibility, just let me know. So we're gonna start with field one, and uh, the first question I guess I could pose this time, I'm gonna be uh, with it, Jacqueline. I'd like to pose a question to the audience, and that question is, if I make that more visible like so, can anyone tell me what's missing from field one? If this is a farm field, if the camera can pick that up, or if Kent can definitely camera guy. present it. We're doing it. Oh, camera guy, we're going over here. Oh yeah, we have two cameras. Yeah. This is a highfalutin professional operation, of course. All right, folks, so now's the time. Access your uh, YouTube chat and let me know the answer to Mitch's question. What was the question? The question is, Kent, what is missing from this farm field? Field one on the set of one, two, three, four, five, six. We have six farm six. fields. Left to right, something appears to be missing from my field one. Uh, Taylor is asking, is it plants? Yes, yeah. that's correct. There is no crop. And thus, if this is representing a real farm field and there is the absence of a crop for the whole growing season, does anyone know what we would call that? I'll give you a hint. It starts with the letter F. It is a swear word, but it has more than four letters and it's a swear word for soil conservationists. As in, it's a farmer practice that's not good for the soil. It's bad for the soil. Starts with the letter F, six letters. Kent may be offering you a hint, the more observant in the crowd. Uh, Kent, oh. Kent, you're not giving away answers though, are you? Absolutely you're not. You're providing hints and clues. That would be untoward of you as a professional educator. Any, any answers to the question, Jack? Not, not yet, but we do have a little bit of a delay, so let's give them okay. a few more yeah, seconds. Sure thing. And then I have a nerdy graph Brad. to present to Brad. put this into context. Brett, are you out there? Apparently there's a Brett in the audience that Kent is familiar with, and he must be quite the uh, stellar individual if Kent is calling upon him. Well, in the last session, uh, Brett oh. answered a couple questions and uh, was very astute at his answers. So Kent I'm... said, whoever your teacher is, make sure you pass him, not realizing that Brett was our teacher from <laughs> Waterhen. <laughs> oh, Kent. No, we don't have any guesses okay. on the farmer swear word. Kent, it almost almost rhymes with marshmallow. Marshmallow, is that a bit of a reach? That's a bit of a it's stretch. It's a bit of a reach. Kent, would you present the answer? It is fallow. Fallow is the term used for uh, the maintenance of a field in the absence of a crop for the whole growing season. Uh, typically, uh, it can be in the early part of the year if the field is too wet, for instance, to seed or if there was some other complication that delayed or prevented seeding on the count of the on the part of the farmer but for the most part i'm going to present this one now you can tell me fellas if there is any glare or some other problem a little closer towards you yes yes <laughs> it's a whole new level hey, yeah Jacqueline? <laughs> is mitchell doing some kind of interpretive dance it's yeah, really strange. As the graph is showing you, the curve is going down over time. From the 1940s and 50s, fallow was quite a common practice back then, but now it's rarely done because farmers practice what is called continuous cropping, Kent. Because can a farmer make any money by not growing a crop? They cannot. No, no. I mentioned uh, organic agriculture in answering a question this morning, and sometimes uh, fallow is required in order to achieve weed control in organic production and uh, green manure crop may be grown and the year sacrificed as far as income. But uh, in most cases, farmers are growing a crop every year. And now I would ask you to take a look at field one and tell me what you think the implications are for environmental sustainability and water quality as Kent. Do you want me to, oh. it's, it's time for you to shine. Uh, for those of you out there who'd like to add some atmosphere, I, I'm, unfortunately, I don't think we have, well, those in the room here could try. I'm not sure, the, not sure that the mic is going to pick that up. But for the kids in grades five and six, when I give this uh, a version of this presentation, they like to make the, their own thunder. Okay, camera. So we're about to subject the fallow field, field one, to a torrential rainfall. 
And if the camera picks it up effectively, and oh, Kent, could you tell us exactly how many millimeters you poured into the rain cloud? Uh, I poured. Katrina is expecting serious science here. Four hundred. Okay, good. Four hundred exactly is uh, what she said. Oh, okay. Now I see it's been raining earlier, and you've had to resort to what are you holding there, Kent? I'm holding the runoff. Yes, he's holding the runoff. So this is the water that is running off the surface, and what that container is representing, and now he's had to resort to a second one, is for instance, it can represent a roadside ditch. The, uh, the, the cut in the ground next to the road, next to the farm field that takes away excess moisture, particularly in the spring prior to when farmers are going to seed. And that allows the ground to dry so that the farmers can seed as opposed to leaving the field fallow. Not a common practice, but we do have a few instances in which farmers do not have control over what they wish to do. And what this uh, set of photos is illustrating is, is what the condition was that uh, the challenge presented to farmers in the year 2011. I'm Can sure most in the audience are far meter? too young to remember anything, anything dramatic, <laughs> hydrologically dramatic in 2011, but there was a big water event in 2011, Kent. You live in Western Manitoba. Do you know what, you know what people were doing in, in Brandon with sand? We were sandbagging. Yes, no sand castles, not hand texturing sandbagging to keep floodwaters away. And in 2011, it was a one in 350 year flood event in the Assiniboine River Valley and farmers were unable to seed many acres. And thus in these photos, you can see, just like in my simulated field, you can see brown, brown portions of the field. And they tend to be the lower parts of the field because, which way does water flow, Kent? Up or down? Up. Uphill. No! Uh, gravity, Ken. Gravity, should we, down! Should we, should, we hey. grab your, should we grab your apple and do a, a Professor Newton and Isaac Newton test? The, yeah, gravity. The camera guys have muted me anyway. <laughs> gravity takes water down. So that's why the low parts of the field could not be seeded in these pictures. And the farmers are left to minimize, minimize the harm to manage those soils in preparation for next year. And in terms of implications for downstream water quality, this represents a worst case scenario. Fortunately, it's not common any longer, as I mentioned. For the most part, farmers are seeding crops every year. If not, otherwise, there would be uh, a susceptibility for a classic uh, process to happen that, uh, that is devastating to the soil resource. It's bad, Kent. It starts with the letter E. This is the example associated with water. I guess we could ask the audience, does anyone know what's happening to the soil from field one? What's the term for it being washed off the land and into the ditch and the water is dirty with sediment? I think I know this bad word, but I'm going to give it a few seconds until okay. I'll see. Starts with the letter E. Yeah, Taylor, Taylor's got awesome. it. I think I'm with Taylor on this one um, with erosion. Yes, it's water erosion. This is classic water well, erosion. Joyce got it too. Fortunately, in Manitoba, it's not prevalent because of continuous cropping. Also. You can see that uh, water can run off this field, but this is pretty typical for Manitoba. There is not a lot of slope on this field. It's only slightly, uh, uh, only as a slight gradient compared to the table, just enough to cause the runoff to occur with a torrential rainfall event, which also relates to Ray's uh, lesson this morning. Our climate here is generally dry. And so we can observe catastrophic Thunderstorm events and water erosion in some parts of the province. Uh, we do have a few examples. Kent, would you care to? Oh, your hands are full. Ray, let's get your uh, good looking masked face in front of the camera over there. I, is it that camera? Yeah, it's that camera. Here's an example of classic water erosion occurring where? Near Dauphin, near Riding Mountain, where we can find steeper slopes and in a major rainfall event, we can observe what we've simulated here. But even in that photo, it's not as though the whole field is being washed off. It's not water erosion devastating the whole field. It's only happening along a particular path in the field. And so uh, what I'm leading you towards is thinking about in our uh, agri-ecosystem here with the climate, the landscape factors and the soil conditions, soil types, we have to ask, ask ourselves what can happen but in rarer circumstances versus what tends to happen. What is dominant versus subdominant? So that's the story from the fallow field, which I can lastly sum up 
for if there is any, uh, there's a little, a little bit of a visibility restriction, of course, with my, my rainfall simulator. So what I'm illustrating here with these two jars is a rough proportion of the water running off the land. So that's the arrow going sideways-ish versus the arrow pointing down, which is water going down through the soil profile and ultimately contributing to groundwater. So in this case, the proportion is definitely skewed towards runoff. And now we move on to field two. And you can tell me if there is a, a contrast to this based on what the camera can pick up. Here we see that a crop is growing, Kent. It's or should done, I use Mitchell. past tense? Yeah, it's done. This is a cereal crop, probably wheat, yep. harvested. Um, and, uh, Mitchell, I think it yes. might be the Fruit Loops crop from earlier today. Oh, <laughs> is that someone's uh, astute suggestion from the audience? Or is yeah, that, that was somebody's breakfast from oh. their earlier session. Oh. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, highly nutritive uh, Fruit Loops. Yeah, 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 that's good validation on your part, Kent. That's perfect. <laughs> fruit Loops should be a food group. <laughs> fruit Loops. All right, so here we have a cereal crop that is no longer growing, but we have to imagine what is beneath the surface that would be missing. Sorry, camera operators, I'm going to be moving around a fair bit here. Let's see if I can rig this up. I'll ask Ray if he would kindly illustrate this to the camera where appropriate. Let me ask the audience, Jacqueline, what will be in the soil of field two with this cereal stubble that would presumably be missing? from field one, where there was nothing growing. It starts with the letter R. I think it's a word heard earlier today. I think we did discuss this word <clears throat> yes. earlier today. So, so the question is, what is in the soil that was not in the soil in field one? Roots. Correct. <clears throat> Roots. Kent apparently has a <coughs> little something in his throat. Yeah, yeah. Kent, you might want to get that letter. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can't. I'm not sure that's um, an astute way to handle this. Ethan, now. Joyce, and Taylor all came in with roots. <laughs> yes, exactly. Wow, that's awesome. All well, right. And Kim. Kim. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's learning. Fantastic. Kim, Kim's now participating Kim, in well, the chat. Kim, well done. Way to embrace the moment. Yes. All right, we heard this morning from Kent. Roots are the fingers of plants to draw nutrients out of the soil. They are also part of the soil's architecture. If we think about how buildings are constructed, roots are kind of like the rebar in the soil, the, the metal framing that helps to hold together a structure, a building of some kind. And so as, uh, as Ray was showing with the sample here, we can see that the soil clods are hanging on to uh, the soil and uh, holding it in place. And that's what's missing from field one in the fallow because there's nothing growing. So in field two, what do we have, Kent? What is the scenario? We have a cereal crop that is seeded every year, what's, uh, how would we describe that, Kent? Kind of like a birthday or Christmas when that happens once a year. What's the A word that would be used for that? Anal. Uh, no. no, no, annual, no, annual. No, that, that's, that's someone who's very particular about <laughs> rules and details. Yes. Annual. Disparaging, yeah. Yeah, so annual, yes. As <laughs> with annual celebrations like birthdays <laughs> and Christmas, Field two is a specimen from an annual crop field. And what time of year is that, Kent? Would you describe that as annual crop in April, annual crop in May, or annual crop in September? I'm going September on this one, Mitchell. Yeah, that's right, because we can see that the field's been harvested, so the annual crop was seeded in the spring, grew throughout the summer, and then is harvested in late summer and fall. And so that's a key distinction between field one and two, and now Kent's going to make it rain. Comes the thunder, the lightning. Oh, it's just a, just a, a soaker, a real soaker. And now uh, I'm not sure if the camera's going to pick this up, but uh, I'm going to point to the container at the front here that represents the ditch. How much runoff is occurring, especially compared to field one? More or less runoff? Jacqueline, is the audience able to pick that up? All right, more or less runoff with field two. That's the question. The runoff is going into the front jar. The water that soaks in through the soil goes into the container underneath each slice of soil. All right, is there any way we can get a closer view? We do have some that can't quite tell. It is. It is going to be difficult, yes. Um, Wataru says less, and Taylor says they can't quite see, but they're assuming it will be less. Excellent. 
in the absence of visible evidence, what they're doing is thinking. Yes, they're thinking it through. What would I expect? Yes, compared to the fallow, now that we have roots and better soil structure that encourages downward movement of water, even from one year's growth of crops, yes, there's very little water in the container that is capturing the runoff at the front is good, is good. And then by contrast, I'm now pointing to what represents the subsoil and the groundwater beneath the field. It contains much more water. And so to illustrate that in a way that's a bit more visible, I'm using my carefully crafted homemade sample jars. And so now the proportion is changing. Much less runoff, as in the sideways arrow ray, and much more downward movement of water. Yes. That segues us then, Kent, into fields three and four. They are similar in that we see plant material on the surface, so something did grow. But we're going back to the signs, Kent. We're not going to reference events that happen once a year. These are perennials. Yes, these are perennial crops. Do, do they look like perennial crops in the middle of summer, July, or more at this time of year, October, November? More this time of year. Yeah, they're not they're looking- quite dead. They're not looking vibrant, are they? By, I could draw a contrast, if you'd care to show that to the camera. That is a recently plucked specimen from near Kent's house at uh, Pilot Mound. There we see some green living tissue. So those plants are still growing, but at this time of year, their growth is slowing down. We see brown stems where the plant is uh, dying off. And uh, we know that's, that's what's inevitable. That's why uh, perennial crops are special for farmers in that they are seeded once, but then unlike annual crops, they don't have to be seeded every year. They will come back next spring, turn green and lush again and regrow. And a key distinction then between field two, which is an annual crop, and fields three and four, my clue, Ray, if you would like to show that to the camera, is this piece of iron. Other camera, Ray. Walk closer. Can anyone tell me what that is, Jacqueline? Can someone identify that piece of iron? It's been crafted into a deadly looking device as far as plant roots go. It's dragged through the soil. The right, action starts Who with the letter T. Identify this. Starts with the letter T. Does it have four letters? Uh, no, it has more than four letters. Oh, yeah, that is a, wrong. I'll give you a hint. That's a cultivator. I'll be more clear here. Uh, that's a cultivator shovel. It's attached to an implement that's dragged through the field by the tractor. And that goes into the soil and it mixes the soil. Do you think that's good for plant roots? It is not. Kent, it is not. It cuts through the plant roots, severs them. Um, the so practice is, starts with the letter T. Yeah, a tiller. Bingo, yeah, yes. Okay. I was thinking till. So. Yes, great. Yeah. I'm sorry, yes, you're right. As a verb, till, to till the ground. The general practice is called tillage, yes. That is something that is yet to be done on field two. After the cereal crop is grown, the field will be tilled. That will bust up the, the roots in the soil and the soil structure, and then the process will have to start again next year. In fields uh, three and four, these are perennial crops. Seeded once, they are not tilled, so that means that the roots and the soil structure are preserved, and they actually build and strengthen over time. And then logically, if I was to call upon Ray to make it rain, fields three and four, the two perennial fields, this one and this one, if you'd like to make it rain. I'll jump ahead to the answer. The trend remains the same or becomes more pronounced. Even less runoff water and more water soaking in through the soil and going down. This, of course, is of interest to farmers in this climate because, as I mentioned, it's a very dry climate here. And so to be able to store water, to encourage water to go down into the soil rather than run off is good, is good for crop growth later in the season when rains become less reliable. And the perennial crops are going to set up for that effect in the biggest way because as I say, there's no tillage and the roots and the soil structure are able to build and maintain. Uh, if you, Kent, would then show this to the camera. 
Thank you. Kent has a specimen of soil. It's a soil clod. And uh, if you take a close look at the camera, you can see Ray. Would you like to go uh, accompany this with his specimen over there? You can see that pores can form in the soil, channels left behind after roots die and decompose, as well as some of the creepy crawly creatures, the wigglers can uh, find their way through the soil and leave channels behind that encourage water movement down through the soil. Those channels will be preserved where there is no tillage. And so that won't be the case for field two. This field will eventually be tilled and those channels be broken up. Whereas in fields three and four, they will be preserved because perennial crop is growing. Uh, the other quick wrinkle here with respect to fields three and four, before I leave that, is uh, a quick reference back to what Ray covered this morning. Ray, you're still up? Yep. To the camera, please. Yeah, get your workout in, man. Let's see those muscles flex. You may wonder why are there two perennial fields, fields three and four. It's because they are from different parts of Manitoba. Field three is from north of Brandon, a clay loam soil, our provincial soil, Kent, which is named. Oh, maybe I could ask the audience. Does the audience represent? Remember what the name of our provincial soil is, Jacqueline. This was certainly covered in this morning's sessions quite clearly. So let's give it a moment, see if anyone remembers. Yeah, in the meantime, what I'll say that's... provincial soil? Yeah, that's field three. So that is the perennial crop with the clay loam soil. Here, Ray, why don't I just switch this order for you? boy. Field four is also a perennial crop field, but near Brandon. And it is a sandy soil. It's important to have good focus, right? Not be distracted by teachers lurking in the background, betraying answers, compromising this entire, Kim, this entire learning experience, right, Ray? It's a good, good thing I teamed up with an upstanding individual like you. Jacqueline, any answer to the question as to the name of the provincial soil? We do not. Oh, what? gasp. What? Uh, yeah. It could, it could be the, the delay. Anybody familiar where Archie and Jughead lived? Rhymes with the name of their, is it their community, Kent, or their high school? Wow, you're Anybody dating yourself. Comics? No hey. way, those comics are, comics are the best, and that was Riverdale. Thank you, yes. And there's a, Kent, there's a TV show called yeah. Riverdale. Hello. <laughs> and now Brett has contributed New Dale. New Dale. New Dale. Oh, yes. Brett. Way to go, Brett. Coming through. All right, so back to wrapping up fields three and four. The difference is texture primarily. Some of the plant material is different, yes. It's not the exact same grass uh, mix, but uh, this is the clay loam field from north of Brandon. We would expect uh, the a greater risk of runoff and less water soaking in because of the clay loam texture being stickier. If it rains hard enough, it will run off the surface before it soaks in. This is the sandy soil from near Brandon. We'd expect to find water more reliably soaking in and very little runoff. So that's how the soil and plant factors can interact. And thus, Kent, one may ask, well, if uh, tilling is bad for downward movement of water and we'd like to keep more water on the land to grow crops, good for the farmers and less running off that could cause water quality impacts downstream, then we should just stop tilling, correct? We could do that. We could do that, or we could try to simulate Yes, and in that, to that effect, we could try to simulate what the perennial crops achieve, and that's what's represented by field one, two, three, four, five. If I was to tell you, Kent, that there is an option for growing crops, that annual crops, that involved no use of heavy iron, what do you think we would call that? Would well, we, we're not going out there so with a tiller, yeah. so there's zero tillage. Yeah, so going on, yeah. I'm going to call that zero till. Oh, okay, well done. Yes, well done. So this is a zero till field zero till. from your friend My Henning's age. farm, yep. yes, near La Riviere, uh, probably in the range of 10 to 20 years of no, no tillage. Uh, I would guess 10, yeah. Yep. Something in that range. And so what accumulates at the surface is organic material, the roots and the soil structure underneath remain intact because there's no tillage, there's no heavy iron crashing through uh, all of those uh, earthworm channels and the, the root channels up behind. And uh, again, that uh, 
is illustrated by these samples that you showed earlier with the, the intact channels uh, that are not disrupted by tillage. So that's how uh, an annual crop farmer can manage the soil to behave like perennial crop. Here's the catch though, Kent. Uh, there's a catch? Yes, there is there is a catch to this, yes. And uh, I refer back to the, the other pop culture reference this morning. Did, did I ask if anyone was into Game of Thrones? Yes. Yeah, you yes. did. What, what's the operative phrase, Ray? Winter is coming, yes. So that's what's illustrated by the final field here in front of me. This is a farm field at what time of year? Hmm. Is it this time of year? Is it May or June, Kent? Doesn't look like May or June. No, do me a favor. Could you poke your, poke your finger here? Is this warm or cold? That's cold. Uh, yeah, you, you could tell better if you actually yeah. feel it. Yeah, you want to embrace, you want to experience this fully. Yeah, it's warm cold. Warm or cold? Yeah, finger it feels hurt. like snow. And now if you were to poke your finger through and, and feel the, the soil beneath, is that yeah. hard or soft? It's very hard. It's frozen, mm. Mitchell. Oh, it's frozen. There's it's frozen. F, there's another F word. Another yes. one. Uh, but not a swear word. Uh, it is, uh, although some, some may swear when, when winter arrives, this is uh, the equalizer. The fact that we have four, five, six months of winter, the ground becomes frozen. Do you think then, Kent, what the farmer is doing affects water movement? Because I have to ask you, how much do you think water soaks into this field if it's hard like your head? There's no water soaking into right, that field, Right, so Mitchell. if it can't go down, what is its only choice, so to speak? What direction will it flow? Across. Yes, it will run off. And that's what this container has collected. Ray, if you would care to show that to the camera. I would like uh, the audience to ask me, uh, to ask me, to answer this question, Jacqueline. Does that water look, oh, I guess I'd better give them the, give them the dramatic comparison here. Which water is cleaner? The water from the, uh, the fallow field, field one that I'm holding, or the water from the frozen field that Ray's holding? So it's the fallow field in summer versus the snow field in winter. Yeah, or I suppose the snow is melting, spring. so it's the transition. That's all right, you're yeah. both correct. It's the transition from winter to spring, yes. So which sample is cleaner? I think I think you lost. Yeah, I think you lost our group here. They're wow. they're they're mystified. Yeah, they're I think that's that question is. Uh, They've, I've I've stunned them into silence. Yeah, you've stumped them. Uh, like or they maybe stumped maybe they here. suspect that it's a bit of a trick question. Yeah. Not a trick question. It, it is it is in a fashion it when it comes to water quality <laughs> chemistry, the fallow field. If I was to ask you, Jacqueline, uh, would you say the fallow fall, the water from the fallow field is is cleaner or the the snow melt water? Uh, well, we now have three that popped in, oh. and they all say that they believe the frozen one is cleaner. Yes, and it certainly looks it right. The catch is, is it actually cleaner? Not necessarily, because uh, does anyone know what uh, what triggers algal blooms in Lake Winnipeg and other freshwater bodies? It's a nutrient that Farmers apply to land and fertilizer. Kent may have mentioned it this morning. Nitrogen is one of the nutrients, yes. It does contribute. What is the main nutrient that contributes to freshwater response of algae? Phosphorus, yes. I know that the chemistry is complicated. We can discuss it further. For today's purposes, we'll say it's phosphorus. And uh, phosphorus. Well, we have two people who got that right on our chat. Oh, Joyce fantastic. and Taylor both uh, contributed phosphorus. Okay, good. This is my sample of algae riddled water. And if phosphorus is the primary culprit, then we have to wonder how does it reach the Lake Kent if we don't have a lot of fallow conditions and torrential rainfall leading to all that dirty water coming off, then how is the phosphorus reaching the lake? Well, if it's attached to soil particles, Kent, what kind of phosphorus do you think we would call that? Oh, uh, it could be suspended or... Mm. Or it could start with the word I just gave you. It starts with letter P. If it's phosphorus attached to, yeah, and phosphorus starts with P. So I'm making this very difficult for Particulate. you. Particulate? Yeah. Particulate phosphorus is the type of phosphorus that is attached to soil particles that leave the land with water erosion, like we see in field one, right? The fallow field with torrential rainfall. Kent, what happens when you make lemonade and you stir the crystals in the glass? 
They disappear. Where do they, they go? They dissolve. Yes, that's right. The second major type of phosphorus is dissolved or soluble. So it's hidden in the water. And that's the catch here, Kent. The, uh, the reason I, I said it was a trick question, and maybe why the audience wasn't answering, they knew I was up to something. It's not about how dirty the water looks. It's about when the water is primarily moving on our landscape. And I'm going to offer you, Kent, would you offer those two numbers to the camera? If the ground is frozen and the water can't soak in, when do you think we tend to see most of our runoff? Jacqueline, I guess we could ask the audience. And what Kent is showing are two numbers, 80% and 20%. So which do you think is responsible for 80% of our runoff in Manitoba, in Agra-Manitoba? Rainfall is in the summertime of year or spring snowmelt on frozen ground? Which is responsible for the bigger number? Okay, so single question. So we've got, the question is, let's repeat that again, just for clarity. Yeah, which is responsible for 80% of our runoff? The spring the snow rain melt? The rainfall driven or spring snow melt? Okay. So which is responsible for not most of our precipitation, most of our runoff from agricultural landscapes? Okay, so we've got, Blair is saying the snow covered. Uh, Joyce, also the spring for 80%. Taylor, the snow melt for 80%. Yes. yes. Waturu is snow 80%. So everyone's uh, unanimous here. Yes. And the answer lay in my reference to Kent's hard head. Yes. If the ground is frozen and the water can't soak in, then that means most of it's going to run off. And that's when most of the phosphorus is leaving. But it's not in particulate form. It's hidden in the water, Kent. It's dissolved. So it's at low concentration. But after many years, what we have is a high load of phosphorus leaving agricultural lands, at least in wet years. And this is an example of genuine snow melt mm -hmm. taken from next to a farmer's field. And yes, it looks clean, but and it is in some respects in terms of concentration. But after many years, we would say actually it isn't. It's what's delivering the phosphorus to the lake to cause its impact. All right, then I guess we're going to wrap Kent in the last couple of minutes with what farmers can do. We talked about what they can do with respect to growing certain types of crops, uh, but how that's limited by our climate in terms of influencing the soil and encouraging water to move down rather than run off. Something that farmers can do in the vein of nutrient management is what I would like you to illustrate with the signs. I mentioned that uh, at the start, I think. Something called 4R Nutrient R's. Stewardship. These are the four principles, and yes, it's a bit kooky. They're the four R's, but R stands for right, Jacqueline, in each case. So it is the right source of nutrient delivered at the right rate. Kent covered those two this morning, so that's the type of fertilizer for the purpose. The rate, as in the kilograms per hectare, in order to feed the crop, based on soil testing, for instance. Right time, which is what we've illustrated now with the rain and snow show, as in applying when the crop is growing, for instance, would be a better time than when there is nothing growing, such as during the winter and early spring. And then finally, right place, which we're going to illustrate in the front. Ray, would you care to join me? Sure. Right place, if uh, the plants are taking up most of their nutrients via the roots, would be where the roots live. And where do the roots live, Ray? They live in the soil. So what we're going to do is provide a quick illustration. I'm going to use the fancy equipment. I'm going to give you four granules of fertilizer. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Yeah, genuine gra granules of furniture. Furniture. Genuine granules of fertilizer. Ray is applying his to the surface. I, by contrast, am creating a furrow in the soil, and because I have the right equipment, if you can use your Sesame Street imaginations, Ray's field is an illustration of broadcast fertilizer application. And that leaves the fertilizer on the surface and thus susceptible to loss if there's a big rainfall event, for instance, and slope to the field. What I've illustrated on my field, the reason my granules are now invisible, this is what's called banding. 
rather than broadcasting on the surface and leaving the granules there, with the right type of equipment, the fertilizer can be placed in the ground and thus protected from loss. Secondly, I gave Ray eight granules. How many granules did I have, Jacqueline? Four. How is it that I can use fewer granules of fertilizer than Ray? That must mean that my method is more efficient, right? To produce the same amount of crop. I believe that your granules will not run off and go directly into the soil. Yes, so I've minimized the risk of loss. I've also placed them in the ground closer to the roots and in a concentrated band. And this I'm now illustrating with genuine fertilizer that the appeal of banding versus broadcast is not just environmental sustainability in farming, but it's also a benefit to the farmer, provided that the farmer can afford the right equipment. It takes half as much fertilizer to grow the same amount of crop because the method is more efficient. That's what makes it the right place to put the fertilizer. And what's interesting in that respect is that that caters to the farmer's interest as a business person, right? To reduce cost of fertilizer, again, provided that the equipment are available while also reducing the risk of nutrient loss to the environment. Thank you. So right. we just have a few minutes left, but yeah. I would love to open it up for questions. Um, just like earlier, we tried to stump Kent. Let's see if we can try to stump Mitchell with some soils questions. I would like to, while they're pondering and submitting, I can quickly answer the question that was raised this morning to Kent, which was regarding capturing runoff water, I believe, or at least runoff water phosphorus. coming out of the system. Yeah, runoff phosphorus. One way is to capture it in the plants, of course such as harvesting cattails in a hydrologically active area, a very wet part of the landscape, or harvesting agricultural crops that we're already doing. Another way to do it is to consider this rather than a ditch, imagine this as an engineered reservoir or a wetland to capture nutrients that, that are in the water. The catch is, though, that if it's going to be engineered, there has to be the right economic model in place for the farmer to afford that. So for example, that would be more common in potato production because the crop is high value and then justifies the investment in an engineered reservoir to capture runoff water that happens to have some phosphorus in it. Uh, alternatively, uh, we have natural features like wetlands and such. The complication is that uh, through the freeze-thaw process, when this is happening, the death of the plant material is actually leaking phosphorus out of the, the cells as they lice and bust open and leak out dissolved phosphorus. And so uh, that means that something like a wetland isn't necessarily, or a riparian area, the green vegetation along the edge of a field isn't necessarily capturing phosphorus and keeping it out of the downstream water body unless there is vegetation to first remove it. And that again is because of our special climate and uh, landscape and soil regime. And lastly, I'll say that the water that runs off compared to the fertilizers that Kent was showing you, very low concentrations. So it's not as though it's actually fertilizer that's being captured in a reservoir. The interest of the farmer will be mainly in the water itself. Thank you. We have a couple questions. Yes. Uh, Jenny is asking, why do we have to use fertilizer that uses phosphorus at all? Why can't we use organic fertilizers that don't end up polluting our waterways? Uh, we can, in principle, tap into the phosphorus that's in the soil. It's about confidence. The ability of a farmer to reliably grow crops and achieve target yields is much less without the use of either synthetic fertilizer or manure because eventually the soil becomes selfish and doesn't want to give up the phosphorus. There are uh, certain life forms in the soil like mycorrhizal fungi that help to free up that phosphorus, but they have to form an association with the crop that's being grown. Otherwise, they won't free up the phosphorus for the next crop. So for instance, canola does not team up with the fungi. And so if I grow a certain sensitive crop the next year, there's no phosphorus for it. Similarly, uh, farmers, those naughty farmers, they've become highly successful at feeding the world. And so with growing more stuff, as Kent was referring to, means removing more stuff, removing more nutrients. And in order to replenish our agricultural system the way it is, it has to be done with significant doses of fertilizer, phosphorus, either synthetic or manure. Otherwise, we simply have to take a hard look at 
our objectives, especially for a place like Manitoba, where agriculture maintains the economy in a big way, we have to re-examine what we expect. Okay, I have a two-part question, and this is a good one. All right. Um, Joyce, you also have some cheerleaders on here uh, for your question as well. This is going to be our last question, guys, for this right. session. Um, could we specifically grow cattails in ditches and harvest those for fertilizer since they reproduce easily and take up lots of phosphorus, kind of creating a mini wetland? The second part to that is also can't we industrialize those ditches to make it so the water caught is harvested, harvested and re-spread onto that crop? And also, since we're moving to GMOs a lot more, would it be possible to modify those plants to not need as much phosphorus? The answer, so yes. The answer to all of those in brief is yes. Yes, those are all conceptually feasible. The problem lies in the details. For instance, harvesting cattails means that they have to, anything that is done has to produce a desired outcome to justify the effort and the energy and the cost put into it. So something has to be done with those cattails. And for instance, if a recipient to use them as biomass burning so a fuel is a, a, a long driving distance away, then we have to weigh the advantage of removing the phosphorus out of that ditch and then the greenhouse gas emissions that come with hauling it to the recipient. Uh, the genetic modification is always in the mix. And lastly, yes, I have seen equipment that can harvest uh, in, a, in an aggressive way, cattails out of ditches. It comes down to the economics uh, of, as to how feasible it is. We have a very big province. We don't have a large tax base. And ultimately, all the numbers have to work in order for something to be adopted. But conceptually, they're on the right track. We need these, these uh, motivated folks to, uh, as Kent was alluding to earlier, to join us in trying to tackle these challenges in the years ahead. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Mitchell and Kent and Ray, who've been here uh, all day so far working together uh, doing the education in the soils bit. We are going to take a short break until 2 o'clock, and we'll be back with Sarah Warwick from IISD Experimental Lakes area. So we are going to learn more about the water end of things, how we can figure out what's in fresh water, and some of the impacts of pollution on it. So it's definitely going to be a really good one. We will see you at 2 o'clock. Hello everyone, welcome back. Thank you for waiting through our break. Our next and final station of the afternoon is going to be learning about freshwater quality, fresh quality with Sarah Warwick from IISD Experimental Lakes area. She's behind me here. I'm gonna be helping her out a little bit with this station. So I will be ready to help you learn more about water. So turn it over to Sarah. Hi guys. So. Um the last question that was asked um, was actually quite interesting. We were asking about cattails and how can they be used to remediate different things. And at the Experimental Lakes area, we actually have been using cattails. We have a PhD student and an honor student, and I think a master student now too, who are doing different things. So we actually have floating wetlands. And basically, kind of think of a piece like this with holes in it, and it can float. It's kind of like rubber or plastic, something like that. And they actually put cattails right inside of it. Okay, once you've drawn it, I'll take it off okay, so, so everybody can have so a look. The cattail's right inside of it. And right now they had put it, that's probably the best drawing I have. So, and, they, <laughs> and they've been putting them in different places. They put them in um, Souris, Manitoba, um, just in some of their like, um, like wetlands there to see if they can kind of actually soak up some of the nutrients. We've been using that experimental lakes area as well and some of our oil spill stuff. And to see if kind of like, even like, if you know cattails, they have a giant root system. So in that, they're not actually put into the soil. They're actually just kind of put on the water. They're floating around, right, kind of free. And actually, this, the root systems actually have a whole bunch of different uh, things going on and bacteria and that kind of stuff grow. And we're kind of interested in what's happening there and what's going on with the, with the cattails. So that's kind of interesting that we're also doing kind of cattail stuff, which is pretty cool, OK? The first thing I'm going to do is kind of talk about who we are and what do we do. Then we're going to do some of the secutest stuff. So when I say that, you can get that out of your kit. We're going to talk about lake water and kind of different colors of lakes. And then we're going to do some of our chemistry stuff. So with your water samples, hopefully you guys got some of those. Okay. So at the Experimental Lakes area, we were kind of born out of this phase where, if you guys heard of Rachel Carson, where she wrote a book called Silent Spring. 
And basically, humans were having an impact on the environment. Around the 1960s, people started noticing that lakes weren't looking as pristine, right? You couldn't just throw trash everywhere anymore. We're kind of actually seeing that as an effect, okay? And then so that kind of uh, brought out us. I'll get Katrina will take this over. And this is kind of where we are at the experimental lakes area. So we actually have 58 lakes. So all those dark blue lakes on that page right there are our lakes that we can actually conduct research on. So we were established in 1968 by the Department of Oceans and Fisheries Canada by three scientists, uh, David Schindler, we have Jack Valentine and Wally Johnson. And we were kind of out of this debate around algal blooms. So I'm going to get the algal bloom. What next? Do, do, do. This one. Mm. Kind of a debate around algal bloom. Exactly yeah. So basically, on that other slide, so we are in northwestern Ontario, okay? So basically, you're driving past Kenora, you keep going towards Thunder Bay, and there's a road that you kind of go down all like this. We're kind of out in the middle of nowhere. So we actually don't have, well, we have internet, but it's not that great. Uh, you don't have cell service out there. Um, so it's kind of, um, and then some of the lakes, you have nothing. So we have radios, and hopefully, you know, nothing bad happens, and we kind of radio each other on those lakes. Yeah. Yeah, so we're kind of built out of this debate around algal blooms, um, and that's kind of how we were born. So basically, the scientists went to this area in northwestern Ontario, um, and that's Lake of the Woods, if you guys have heard of Lake of the Woods, and there's a whole bunch of little lakes around each other. So that's basically where they went out, and they were given by the government this piece of land. So, and they wanted all these lakes that were different types of lakes, because some of our lakes are wetlands, some of them um, are uplands, some of them are lowlands, some of them feed into each other. So all these lakes are kind of different. And that's kind of what we wanted for our experimental lakes area. Okay, and what makes us unique is that we conduct whole ecosystem research. So, which is pretty interesting because there's nowhere else in the world where you can actually conduct whole ecosystem research on lakes. We won't always conduct um, whole ecosystem research on lakes. Sometimes we'll actually do test tubes in the water. So sometimes we'll do a whole lake. Sometimes we'll just put what's called a limno corral. So basically a test tube in the water. So we'll actually just put something in the test tube in the water, which is pretty interesting. Okay, so our first experiment, that's okay. The first experiment was eutrophication, okay? So basically we didn't understand what was going on in these lakes. So we didn't know if it was nitrogen or if it was phosphorus causing those algal blooms. So we added, so there, again, there's that curtain. So we added one side, we added nitrogen. The other side, we added carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And we wanted to see which side was the algal bloom occurring on it. And so you can clearly see one side, there is that algal, the P kind of green. So we knew that that side was causing algal blooms. And this, yep. We can review from this morning what these three letters stand for. Okay. Uh, on the green side of the lake, what does the letter P stand for? And we have Joyce um, is saying it stands for phosphorus. Yeah, exactly. And so this research actually led to some cool things. So when we do things at the experimental lakes, I know doing experiments on lakes is super interesting and fun, but we actually want to affect change and change the world, affect policy, try to help the world, you know? So this actually led to laundry detergents being phosphate free. Uh, and also now there's regulations on fertilizers that are, those farmers are applying to their fields. And also there's limitations in phosphorus released by wastewater treatment plants. So you can actually go online, uh, the Winnipeg uh, uh, wastewater treatment plants, and you can actually look at how much phosphorus, how much nitrogen is actually being released from the wastewater treatment plants, which is actually quite interesting. So these um, experiments we do on lakes, we have three phases, if you want to go kind of show this. So our experiments take a long time. It doesn't just take one year. It takes a long time. So there's three years where we kind of will assess a lake. So we'll go out, we'll pick a lake. So we're actually gearing up to do a microplastics experiment, which is actually my background. And what we'll do is we'll pick a lake, and then we have to assess the lake. So we have to see what zooplankton are living in that lake. What's the water like in that lake? What are the fish populations? Then we will actually go and we'll start our experiment. So let's say it's a microplastics experiment. We'll actually start putting microplastics in the lake. 
we'll have a lot of PhD students and all that kind of stuff. Uh, master students, undergrads, we have a lot of students that work out there and they will actually go and take samples. So one of them will be in charge of maybe zooplankton, one of them might be in charge of fish, one of them might be in charge of the chemistry. And then the last phase is our remediation. So we actually have to make our lakes go back to the way they were. So we can't just alter a lake and then walk away. We actually have to remediate it and make it go back to the way it was. Okay. So that is the background that I'm going to talk about for right now. So right now you're going to get out your secchi discs, okay? Are there any questions at all? No questions, but let's have the ongoing request to try to stump our scientists here. Yeah, go for it. If you have any questions about um, water and any of the topics that are coming up, so. please ask at any time. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so you guys have a secchi disc in your um, kits. On the back, it kind of printed out kind of what a secchi disc is and how it can be used, which is nice. And so right here we have water that are, called, that are different colors. And Katrina's going to come up to the camera. We're going to show you water that is different colors. So basically, we're going to... I'll just carry the water up first sure. and then I can bring the other things. Okay. So. All right. But you didn't know water could be this color. <laughs> Tell me when we're good. Okay. All right. And then these might be a little bit trickier to see the differences between, but we have a swamp on your right and a lake on your left. So this comes from a very shallow water body, a wetland called a swamp, where there's not a lot of wind mixing. The one on this side here, this is the lake. Oh, I'm spilling some marsh water. So there is a little bit of a difference between those you might be able to see, but with your own eye, it might be a little bit tricky to figure that out. Um, we do have a question yeah. coming in. Uh, is there any bacteria that eats nutrients such as phosphorus, and what kinds of bacteria do the floating wetlands actually have? Oh, wow. Hmm. That's Interesting. So that's what the PhD student is actually doing. So they'd put those floating wetlands in our oil spills. And basically, so in the Gulf of Mexico, there have been quite a few oil spills that have happened there um, historically, right? So basically, we know that there are bacteria there that can actually eat oil. So the bacteria there um, like have probably always been there, and then now they're able to evolve and eat oil. So we were wondering if the bacteria that live on our cattails in a freshwater ecosystem that have never had an oil spill, can they develop that? Can they learn to eat oil? So that's kind of what we were wondering and one of the pieces is she is doing that she's taking all the different bacteria things and she's going to actually figure out all the dna and that kind of stuff she hasn't done that yet so i don't have any data but yeah they're working on that i just have to say that's fascinating it is it is and like what's cool too i think you can look online at some of our things it's just like the like what goes on underneath so you can see the cute little cattail with like the brown little part and then underneath there's just like this much roots and like all these different things going on underneath so the underneath is what they're actually focused on, right? The root system and what's going on, which is quite interesting, right? So cool. Okay, so your secchi discs, we're actually going to make secchi discs. So secchi discs are an effective tool to actually measure the productivity of a lake. So a uh, lake to be productive, so kind of think about yourself being productive at school and actually doing your homework and that kind of stuff. Same thing for a lake, right? It's the ability to support life, so algae, fish, and all that kind of stuff in the lake. So if you think of Lake Winnipeg, do you think that's a highly re uh, productive lake? That's a good question to ask the audience. So you guys can answer that while we're talking about it. So is Lake Winnipeg highly productive or is it not? Is it not productive at all? We'll see. I think you could compare that to a lake in the, in the boreal forest yeah. as a comparison. We have a lot of northern communities up here yeah. uh, participating. So is Lake Winnipeg productive compared to some of our lakes that we have in northern Manitoba or around your surrounding communities? And uh, we have a whole bunch of Yay. no's <laughs> coming in that Lake Winnipeg is not productive oh. in comparison. Well, that's interesting. Interesting, but actually Lake Winnipeg is productive. It's eutrophic because there's a lot of nutrients, right? All those nutrients actually make it productive. Fish, they're actually quite bigger and that kind of stuff. They have a lot of algae. Remember those algal blooms, right? So it actually is productive. I mean, it's, you don't really want it to be that productive, but it actually is a quite productive. Like versus some of our licks, they're not very productive. They're called oligotrophic. They actually have almost no nutrients. We have to have 
this chemistry equipment that costs like hundreds of thousands of dollars, and I work in the chemistry lab sometimes, to actually analyze the like tiny, tiny, tiny amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus that are actually in our water. So yeah. So are you saying that you can have too many nutrients in a lake? Definitely too many nutrients, yeah, for okay. sure. Yeah. But then it's very productive. Very productive. Okay. Very productive, yeah, for sure. And then, so we use these. So last time I was at the experimental lakes area, about a month ago, we actually used this, okay? I was on a boat, okay? My little boat right there. And we actually put it over the side, okay? So when you're actually using this tool, you basically put it over the side of a boat. You have a string on it. We'll do that in a second, okay? And basically, you want to see, actually, you want to be able to see what's going on. So you want to be able to see this looking down on the boat, okay? If you have a darker lake versus a lighter lake, okay, we'll think about that too. Are you going to be able to see the secchi disk? So are you going to be able to see as far down into the lake? Any, qu any, any suggestions? We can set up our demo if you want. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to put this. While they're pondering here. that, a question did yeah. come in. Um, how much more productive is Lake Winnipeg now than it was yeah. like years ago in its more natural state? Can you look at it from this? the top? Um, that's a good question. I would say I'm not entirely sure, um, but, but because of all of the, the historical use of phosphorus and all that kind of stuff, I'm sure that it is more productive now than it used to be. While we're setting we that up, so you this. guys can actually make your secchi disc if you haven't already. I gave, I gave the classes instructions. So basically you're going to take this string and put the string around it. You're going to kind of tie a little knot. We're going to put it through the hole first. Hang on, we're just going to dis okay. do the display here just to show. Okay. So what we can see here is the very dark water. If you can look down through the top, you won't be able to see any of the pattern of the secchi disk. This lighter brown water, you can just start to make out that black and white pattern. But when we look at our clearer water from the wetland, you can easily see the black and white. And that's how you would be able to use a secchi disc in a lake, is you would see how far it went down into the lake before you lost sight of it. That could tell you something about what's in the lake water. And then if you kind of think about that, so the farther so you, you can kind off. of see down into a lake, it's going to be different, right? So that one lake that you can't really even see the secchi disc versus the other, the other lake where you can see down, the communities are going to be different because more light can get deeper down into the lake. All right, so we're ready to show make the making of the disc. Yes, let's do that. We're making the move a lot. Yeah. <laughs> We're good? Okay, so basically you'll have your washer, okay? First you're gonna basically put your string through, okay? And then you're gonna tie your washer on the other side. So you wanna make sure, again, this side is facing up because this is the side you're gonna wanna look at. And then I just tied kind of a knot around my washer, that's all I did. Okay. And then the ones we have at ELA are, are plastic. This is kind of just laminated, sorry, that's all I could do. Okay, and then we actually have lines on our rope. So we have lines that are basically the one meter depth, and then we go two meter, three meters, four meters, five meters. And every time at five meters, we have it colored a little bit differently, just so we can kind of um, put it down faster, because we know kind of the depths of our lakes. So what we would do is we're on our boat, and we're actually on the non-sunny side. I always wear sunglasses, so I actually have to take my sunglasses off, because sunglasses will actually help you look deeper into the water. You don't want that. You want to be able to use your naked eye. And then you will basically take it, put it off the side of the boat, and you keep lowering it and lowering it and lowering it until you can't see it anymore. And then you put your finger right there. And then you pull it back up until you can see it again. You would think that where you lower it and where you pull it up will be the exact same, but it's actually not, which is very interesting. So you'll go like this, and then I usually go like this, and then that. And then I take a measure, and we'll measure what it is. And we do that on our lakes all the time. So we have um, 11 lakes that we actually measure um, monthly, and we've been measuring those lakes for 52 years. So we have 52 years of monthly measures in the summer, in the winter, not so much, in the summer of those lakes. So we actually have data 
for 52 years, which is insane. So we can actually understand what our lakes, how, are, how they have changed over that time, which is very interesting. We have a question about the lakes yeah. again. Um, how did you remediate that lake that you tested with half phosphorus and half without? Um, and why can't we do that with other lakes or is that being done with other lakes? Adding to that, could you test with one lake with that extreme eutrophication and test the floating wetlands on that? Since from their understanding, the floating wetlands are mostly used on oil. But is, I, and my comment is perhaps that's the type of bacteria that you were describing that they're testing, the different type of bacteria to test it on phosphorus. Oh, that's a lot of questions. Okay, what was the first question? Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> I can answer all those, but I... <laughs> first question. How did you remediate the lake that you tested half phosphorus, okay. half without? So the interesting thing about our lakes is some of our lakes, um, we actually have to help do things, but that lake, we actually just pulled the curtain away and we just left it. So we left it in over time because our lakes are pristine, they're clean. There's no humans except for really us muddling around in there. But sometimes there's like canoers, but they're not supposed to go in our lakes. They're marked. So that lake actually just over time, it was fine. So that lake, we actually didn't have to do too much. One of our other lakes for acid rain study, we actually murdered, we didn't, you know what I mean? Sorry about that, uh, mice. So they're freshwater shrimp and our populations plummeted. So I think they were counting like 10 or something. Like there's like none in there. And now they actually have to put mice in because they're trying to get those populations back up. So that's another way they had to reme remediate that lake to actually kind of fix it. So remind me how many years it's taken for the lake that had the phosphorus added to return to what it was before. Oh, I don't know. It wasn't that, it was like a decade. It wasn't that, it was quite a bit. The, the reason why it'd be hard for Lake Winnipeg, if you think about it, is that our lakes are pristine, so they're in the middle of nowhere. There's no human interaction. Lake Winnipeg, there's lots of human interaction. There's people fishing, there's people boating, right? there's people at cottages, right? And there's all those fields with all the runoff going into it. So it's really hard to remediate a lake like that when you don't actually know what the point source of phosphorus is. So that's kind of where it's more challenging versus us. We were the point source. So it's easier for us to remediate the lake. Okay, good. I think that answers both parts of the first question. The second question is, um, could you do a test with one lake um, and test the floating wetlands on that? Um, since from their understanding, it's mainly being used for uh, oil. Or floating wetlands? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they, they've been, they're doing different things with our floating wetlands. So we actually have a few people there, our water team, that's what they call themselves. So they're doing lots of different things with the floating wetlands. In Suris, they actually just put a few of them out in Suris. You can find a YouTube video somewhere. You can watch them actually doing this. And they're using that for phosphorus and nutrients to try to see if they take it up and then they can harvest them. So yeah, that's what they're doing it for. We're just trying to see if maybe it's called natural bioremediation because uh, cattails are natural, so they want to see if they, they were actually kind of impacting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so, you. Those are the questions? Okay. Okay, so we kind of lake colors a little bit, okay? So now I want to kind of think about all these different types of lakes, okay? So if you think about these lakes and sunlight penetrating into the lake, this lake right here is, is, is sunlight going to penetrate as deep, let's say, as a lake over here. Okay, that's kind of a, that's a question. And kind of what, how will this affect the lake? That's a good question to ask you guys too. I think you guys are pretty on the ball, so maybe you guys can answer that question for me too. All right, we'll give them a, a few more moments here. Hey, we do have a response that plants won't get as much sun if it's dark. Yeah, definitely. So if you think about this one right here, this is actually coffee that I made, okay? So this is coffee. So basically, if you think about it, it's not going to go as deep, the sunlight in that lake, as let's say that is our marsh. So it's actually maybe going to go here. And what's stopping it from going super deep is actually what's called dissolved organic carbon, okay? So that is... Basically, carbon is like us, so things that were once alive, okay, organic carbon, things are once alive. And they're basically, it's little bits of particulates. So this one is T, and that's actually kind of more accurate. Okay, so it's little bits of leaves, it's the tannins and leaves that have actually come out, so it's kind of the coloring right there. It can actually be also algae and all those other 
bits of suspended particles from our soil guys over here too, okay? All of that is actually not letting the sunlight go as deep into a lake, okay? And causing it to maybe be a little bit darker, yep. Uh, and we have a comment from Taylor to add on to that. Um, plants getting less sun maybe gives fish and stuff less oxygen for breathing. Yeah, exactly. So let's say uh, this lake, the sunlight doesn't go as deep, okay? If the sunlight's not going as deep, you guys already said it, the algae can only actually grow in here. But this lake, the clearer lake, algae can grow even deeper. If the algae is all the way up there, they're the base of the food web, everything else needs to move up there. So your fish are going to have to move up there. Fish are also visual, so to visually see, they're going to have to actually come back up to the surface to visually see. Zooplankton so is actually squeezing organisms at a kind of the top layer of a lake. So it's actually going to change what's going on in the lake. Okay. We're going to now switch to lake chemistry. Ah, oh, Katrina's going to help me with this. Okay. Yes. So we have our samples. So we took a swamp. I don't know what you guys have for samples. We have a swamp, a lake, and a marsh. Okay. And we're going to test it for phosphorus, phosphorus, and nitrogen, and um, what else did I have? Oxygen. Oxygen. Yeah. Oxygen. Okay. Right. So for these okay. samples, you're going to take your little test tubes. You'll fill it up. I think they're all five milliliters. So you're going to fill them up five milliliter lines and you guys are going to kind of follow the directions that are on there okay all right so we're going to do which which are we going to do first phosphate oh. sure okay let's do a phosphate test so for the phosphate test i believe you fill to the five milliliter line and i'm going to test the lake from Fort White. This is a Fort White Lake. And then Sarah's going to test the swamp. We're both going to test for phosphate in the water. And we've been talking about phosphorus a lot today and where it comes from. I'll give you one of those. This one takes a little while to develop too. This one has a five minute wait time. So you're going to pop that tablet into your water, your five milliliters of water, and you're going to shake it really, really well until all of the tablet has dissolved. It doesn't dissolve that easy, so shake it. <laughs> yeah, you got to really go for it. And then make sure your lid is on, Katrina. <laughs> and then once you wait that five minutes, you're going to see a color change. And in this kit, I believe it's blue. Yeah. Yeah, so it's going to change to blue. The darker the blue, the more phosphate that you have in the water. These were not the best lids. <laughs> These are actually used in our chemistry lab at ELA, so my bad. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. So if anyone out there wants to make a prediction, here at Fort White, our lakes, our man-made lakes, they don't have an inflow or an outflow, so we're not receiving any nutrients from outside of Fort White, but anyone who has been to Fort White or anyone who'd like to come here, if you come here, you're going to see a whole lot of Canada geese and they're going to be sitting on the lake all night long, especially at this time of the year. And we talked about manure earlier today. So geese also produce some of that. And manure does have phosphorus. You can think about that. We have our swamp here, which is a shallow water body, kind of like those, tr those wetlands that we've been talking about or the floating platforms, lots of cattails in there, but also some geese and ducks that are around as well. Just a smaller water body. Okay, we're gonna leave those to mature. So phosphorus is an interesting one. What's the other ones that we wanna take uh, a look nitrogen. at? Nitrogen. Nitrogen. Okay, so why do we wanna look at nitrogen? I'm gonna do this one again. Can you look again? Okay. Okay, I think. Do you wanna help her to do the marsh testing? We could do three, yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We got Kent in here, Kent. <laughs> okay, so if we do, I'll do a phosphorus one quickly for that because okay. the timer is running on those guys already. Okay. Okay, Arif, I'm going to do your nitrogen one. Okay, and this will be your phosphate one. Okay. And I'm just going to. Hello, everybody. Hey. Nice well, a uh, quick that? introduction to Mr. Potassium here, who we were talking about earlier. Arif Kasim, also science instructional coach with Frontier School right. Division. I'll get, do the nitrogen one for... 
Yeah. I'll do the. That is your phosphorus, and this one will be your nitrogen. So you're gonna add. You'll add one of each of these. Okay. Apples, yeah, apples. Apples. You're you're in charge of marsh. You're I'm, all. I'm marsh. You're you're marsh. I'm the marsh. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna be swamp. I'm gonna do up my nitrogen one. How many milliliters for the nitrogen? Is it five uh, or it's ten? Still, it's five for all of them. Oh, oh great. That one you're gonna put in test tubes. So there we go. One first. So. So Katrina, yeah. can you just give a little indication of what exactly first, you yeah. guys are doing? Yeah. Um, You've got a good system here. You're going through it really efficiently. We'll show our audience at home what to right. do. Right. So uh, what you received at your kits are some instructions for this. Basically, we have these tiny tablets that are dried chemical reagents, and we add them to the water, and we follow the instructions. Some of these uh, chemical experiments have a bit of a time wait that we have to have to watch the color mature. But at the end, whatever we've added is going to react with what's in the water and produce a color. And that's going to be able to tell us what the level of nitrogen or phosphate or oxygen is in, this, in these water samples. Um, so it's very basic chemistry because they've, the chemical company that's produced these have just put them in a little tablet form. Rather than having to mix a whole bunch of liquids in the lab, it's a little bit of a simpler way to do it. Or is that at a piece so we can All right. So this one is ready for the nitrogen test. So phosphate, phosphorus, we know from that experiment in the lakes at uh, Experimental Lakes area no, that that is the most yeah, important yeah. nutrient that affects our productivity yeah. or how much algae there is it's in a freshwater lake. Neighbors. Nitrogen or nitrate. Does anyone know what a source yeah. of nitrogen or nitrate would be going into lakes? That's a really good question for the people to think about while we're doing this experiment. All right, so sources of nitrogen going into lakes. If you watched earlier today. So that one's dissolved, and then I need my second. Thank you. Cool. So for the nitrogen test, if you're doing it, you'll notice there are two packages of nitrogen test tablets. One is called Nitra 1, and one is called Nitra 2. Make sure you add the Nitra 1 first, and then dissolve it, and then add the Nitra 2. All right. OK, we have a comment uh, from Joyce as uh, sources of Nitrogen commercial fertilizers and maybe erosion can cause nitrogen fixation. Right. right. Commercial fertilizers came up again with Taylor. Yeah. yeah. We can get uh, nitrogen fixation into the soil from legumes. We talked about that. Talked, uh, I don't know if we talked about nitrogen coming in from lightning strikes in no, the soil. No. But that is another yeah, source one. of nitrogen. But if we're talking about nitrogen or nitrate pollution, wastewater um, and commercial fertilizers are, are sources for those. So, all right. We have a question. Does animal um, manure create, bring nitrogen into yes. um, lake water? Yes. Yeah. Uh, in different forms, though. Maybe some of the soil guys want to chip in. Uh, I can chime in if you would. Yeah, What's please. the... Yeah. Just take Mom this. Is, we need to get yeah. yeah. Five mLs, I think. Oh, right. Yeah. I have gloves on. Again, <laughs> yes. The uh, the nitrogen sources from agriculture would be uh, commercial okay. fertilizer. Can I do my oxygen one now too. Uh, as uh, illustrated by Kent with his samples this morning. Uh, nitrogen in manure, yes, uh, which varies in its forms. Katrina mentioned that. Liquid pig manure, for instance, contains a more readily available nitrogen, which is good in that the plants in the fields could take it up more quickly, but it also means it's more susceptible to loss okay, that's five, okay. uh, in short order, like commercial fertilizer nitrogen. There's also a slow-release form of nitrogen, organic nitrogen, in manure. It's more prevalent in a solid manure, such as associated with cattle production, for instance. Oops. And uh, to clarify the suspicion of erosion, uh, again, it's not a dominant factor in our agricultural landscapes. Oh. Secondly, uh, nitrogen does not tend to associate as much with soil particles as a phosphorus would. Nitrogen is more likely to either leach down through the soil profile as nitrate in a sandy soil in particular, uh, and dissolved in the water, that's leaching, or it's a major culprit when it comes to the greenhouse effect. Nitrous oxide is the most potent greenhouse gas, and it's associated with 
you think of that figure that Ray was showing, lower positions in the landscape, excess moisture, the nitrogen gases off as nitrous oxide. And so it's certainly relevant to surface water quality, but it is arguably or in fact more dynamic and even more complicated than, than phosphorus in terms of the forms and the chemistry and how it can be transport, transformed and then transported from agricultural land, for instance, to the atmosphere and then to waters. It's interesting what the marshes down there. And lastly, I would pose a question to the aquatic scientists. Uh, are some algae or other aquatic plants, uh, I know it's the nomenclature is complicated, but uh, are some capable of taking nitrogen out of the air like alfalfa is a legume in crop production in agriculture? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, so that's one of the reasons why at the experimental lakes area we believe that phosphorus should be regulated at unwaste water treatment plants and should be uh, like filtered out even more than nitrogen per se because the blue-green algae that grow in lakes can actually create their own nitrogen. So if you actually take away nitrogen out of a lake, they don't care. They can actually grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger. Still, it doesn't matter to them. To them, uh, sorry, to them phosphorus is the thing that matters. So yeah, sneaky guys. All right. Blue-green algae. Speaking of phosphorus, uh, our results are in already for our phosphorus tests here. Uh, so I'll take them over to the camera here. All right, so from right to left, we have swamp, lake, and marsh. And we have a color key so that you can use to match it up against. Here, I'll take that. There we go. All right. So. So you can see this sample here from our mar swamp. No, I'll just, I'll just be, it's fine. Uh, this is from our swamp here. So it looks like it's lining up with about a two. For this scale, that's two milligrams per liter of uh, phosphor phosphate, which is a, quite a high amount. It's in the eutrophic range. If we move on to the lake, we've got something a little bit lower. We're looking around a one, which is still enriched, but not um, as high as the one before. And then uh, this last one, which is from our marsh, is somewhere in the middle, somewhere in the middle. So we're actually seeing a really high level of phosphate in our water from our wetland. And we've been talking about how wetlands are so good at removing phosphate. Does anyone want to help to try to solve that mystery? Why is the phosphate level high in the wetland right now? This connects a little bit back to Mitchell's question about season. Uh, the reference to Game of Thrones that came up. What, <laughs> what season is coming, but more what season are we in right now? And how might that affect how much phosphorus is in the water in a wetland? Any answers from the audience can come in, but I'm sure we can answer some of that as well as we go. Let's see if anybody comes in with some answers. Sure. Joyce is saying that it's fall, so the cattails are dying and nutrients are returning to the water because of plant decay. Bang on. Awesome. Yeah. Joyce, you Great. might need to come nice. in so and uh, present with us on yeah, our next yeah, session. Yeah, be my assistant. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> in our lake, we do have some too, though. So another question yes. was all of the goose, or another contribution was all of the goose poop. Yeah. So that's where we would expect to see uh, phosphorus in our lake coming from and we do see some in, in the lake as well coming in from that there might be some other uh, yeah. sources you could talk about too but yeah and then nitrate so next is nitrate okay I'll carry those up Where's, which one? this one here oh. That's not, it's not very nitrated no uh, well no, no. I we'll think see. here we go Marsh is on the side. We'll see for that so one. this nitrate one, we're not coming up very high, but there is a little bit of a yellowish color here. We're seeing it somewhere between less than five, but more than zero. <laughs> this is the swamp, the lake, and the uh, marsh. They're all fairly similar. Well, fairly similar. Right, so Fort White doesn't have any inflow from wastewater uh, or from uh, crops and things like that. 
Right, so that's how we'd expect to see there. Now, you'll notice that these, they don't have uh, really accurate numbers. The numbers are on a broad scale. That's because these are simple tests you can do. Chemists in a lab and even some remote equipment you can use can give you much more accurate uh, results on things like this, which are used by scientists. So this uh, is our oxygen levels. It's actually looking like there's not very much oxygen in the water, but this test does take about 10 minutes to develop. So if you wait a little bit longer, it does get a bit darker. So this is uh, our first color here, and we're looking up against this side. So it's somewhere again between zero and four parts per million. If we had a lake with lots of oxygen in it, we'd be quite excited about how the fish were doing. We'd be have something up around the eight parts per million for oxygen. Okay. So again, another question for the audience. Why would oxygen levels be a bit lower in our swamps and marshes at this time of the year? So people can think about that one. All right, we'll give our, our group a moment to answer that one about the oxygen levels and we can continue on and we'll see what comes in. Sure. Do you want to sure. some photos? So this is what our chemistry lab is. So this summer, thanks for your mm, yeah. friend helped us. Okay, so our chemistry lab uh, that we have at ELA. So this summer I actually had to work in the chemistry lab because of COVID we actually had, uh, we were only allowed to have seven people on site. So I actually had to be in the chemistry lab, which normally I would have been a student, not me. Um, so, which is very interesting. So basically the first picture I believe are the samples. So, am I right? Yeah. 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 So basically I actually had to go out too. So I had to go out to a lake and we have to collect all those samples. So first we'll do the secchi disc depth thing, right? Then we have to take a pump in the water and we put it at different depths in the lake. We actually take all of these samples. And then after that, we uh, put the samples through different things. So, so the next one? A filter. The filter, yep. Which one's that one? It's a green uh, Yeah, so filter. that one is for our uh, algae and that kind of stuff. So you put the water through that and that is what came, was in the water that, that you the pulled water, out yeah, on the filter. Yeah, we'll do that at different depths so we can see um, how much algae is growing at different depths of the lake. Okay. So again, Next if you think about the one. oxygen, there might be different oxygen at different depths of the lake, maybe different amounts of algae at different depths of the lake. This one? Yeah. And then that one, so our nitrogen, if you remember, was supposed to actually turn red, and that is our nitrogen analyzer right there. So you can see that it is color metric, so it is actually red as well, which is kind of interesting. So it's kind of the same thing, but that equipment is very expensive, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you have a picture of the lab? Yeah, and then the last one, that is the pod that I, was, I worked in basically once a week every month. That's the, la that's the pod I was in, that's pod three. So that one we do pH. Conductivity, we do silica, so silica has to do with algae in, in some of our lakes. Um, we also do DIC, so dissolved inorganic carbon. That one's kind of fun. You get to shoot um, air into different things and kind of watch it spike, so that one's kind of fun too. Thank you. you. So yeah, we do have um, the theories about the oxygen now. Uh, oh, perfect. Joyce has stated that plant decay needs oxygen, so it's taking up some and since they're dying there's not as much oxygen then being produced um jenny says that phosphorus in the algae takes in the oxygen uh, not as much but uh the, the first answer with the balance at this time of the year is definitely correct so when things are decomposing the decomposers out there they breathe oxygen like we do so they use it up so as the plants are dying off starting to decompose the decomposers are using the oxygen but also because the plants are dying off, they're not producing oxygen because they're not doing photosynthesis this time of the year. So it's, it's definitely a balanced thing there. Thank you. Yeah. We do only have a few minutes left, so I encourage our audience to uh, bring in any questions if they have any last minute questions here while you guys finish up. For sure. So uh, remember we have those 52 years of data and we actually have noticed that our lakes, just if that front one's fine. So these we are some of the things that uh, experimental lakes area has discovered uh, over the 52 years of data on some of those lakes so we've noticed that our lakes are actually getting darker so in the area that we are in in northwestern ontario um, our lakes are predicted to get darker in the future because we actually have more precipitation so remember as things rain we have all of that leaf litter and all that organic material is going into the water causing them to get darker 
So, which is kind of interesting. So our lakes are projected to get darker in the future. And does, does anyone know over there? Like, like in the, can in the you get a lake that's like this color, like teal? Oh, for sure, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any thoughts about what's going to happen to our lakes if they get darker? What's going to happen to our fish communities? What's going to happen to the algae communities? Is there any predictions? Ooh, great. Um, while we wait for those predictions to come in, we do have a question yeah. um, from our newest assistant. <laughs> assistant, how can we get connections to ELA if we're interested in working there? Oh, we have um, pro, uh, we have jobs so that you can become a uh, if you want to be an undergrad, you can be an undergrad. Um, so if you go to university, there's a bunch of different jobs. You can be an undergrad working on a project. So let's say the microplastics project, you can actually be part of that project. And there's also people that work in different parts of it. So you can actually be with the lake sampling crew, so the people that went and did all that type of stuff that I had to do. We also have the chemistry as well. They hire about three students. Um, there's also fish crew. Fish crew is a fun crew to go out and sample fish. So again, you can do that. You can work for me. I always hire an education student as well. So there's lots of opportunities for students that want to, let's say, do a master's or PhD, or if you just want to like, learn more about fish too. You just have to like the outdoors. That's really the one requirement. Be super pumped and want to learn and like the outdoors. So. Awesome. All right, so we're still waiting on a predictions on what will happen if the water does get darker. We have one minute left. So. Okay. We can give you a few hints. We it's kind of the same stuff that's going to happen Some pictures here. of... Yeah, for us, this is... So this is actually... Am I going to go? Yeah, you can go. Okay. So this is actually Aiden, I believe. And so if you think about how if the water, it basically, if less sunlight can go down, um, it's going to actually, the lake's going to become colder, right, over time. So this is going to fish, this is going to push the fish species kind of higher up. Remember, they're visual predators, so they have to actually move higher up to find their food. The algae is going to only have a, a smaller band where the algae can actually grow. So it's actually going to change what's going on in the lake and it's going to squeeze that's the kind of word we like to use it's going to squeeze everything to that top band up there so less room for them to kind of hang out and uh, joyce commented that fish will die probably because algae will grow even more and since a lot of the algae growing right now is blue green algae which can't really be used as a food source for zooplankton so the food chain just won't work yeah, we're noticing that our fish are getting smaller. So that's another thing. We're actually noticing because they're getting smaller again because they're squeezed into that smaller area. And there's more things that have to eat in that smaller little band at the top of the lake. So you're totally right. Yeah. We're good. Okay. Well, I, that, is, that is the end of our day in terms of the time that we have. Uh, so thank you everyone so much for joining us here for our first soil and water day uh, here at Fort White Alive. I want to give a big thanks to all of our presenters that were here today. So we had Ray Cochran, Kent LaWarn from Nutrients for Life, Mitchell Timmeron from Manitoba Agriculture, uh, behind me Sarah Work from IISD Experimental Lakes area. In order to get some more learning resources from those folks, I'm going to be sending out an email with uh, so the websites for some of those organizations, as well as contact information for those presenters to you all. Um, I'll also be sending out uh, the evaluation form along with that. So we'd love to hear from you some of your feedback about how today went for you, what you learned. Um, and if you are a teacher watching, uh, just get some feedback on how this might connect to the things that you're teaching your students outside of today. Um, I'd like to give another huge thank you to Frontier School Division, to Jacqueline over here, as well as our tech crew. They've done a fantastic job today at getting this out for all of you. Uh, so thank you so much to them as well. Um, and thank you to all of you for watching and engaging and asking questions. Those, uh, your questions are really important. Your learning is really important. Um, and you are the future of these types of fields. So if these are things that you're interested in doing in the future, um, definitely these are some new career options that you can think about. So thank you all again for joining us. And we will say goodbye for now. <laughs>